stand it. Do you think I'm going to stand for these excuses? Oh, yes, you're having a good time, I dare say. Midge interrupted, speaking sharply and distinctly. The police? The police, you say? It was almost a scream. You're mixed up with the police? Setting her teeth, Midge continued to explain. Strange how sordid that woman at the other end made the whole thing seem. A vulgar police case. What alchemy there was in human beings. Edward opened the door and came in. Then, seeing that Midge was telephoning, he was about to go out. She stopped him. Do stay, Edward, please. Oh, I want you to. The presence of Edward in the room gave her strength, counteracted the poison. She took her hand away from where it had laid over the mouthpiece. What? Yes. I am sorry, madame. But after all, it is hardly my fault. The ugly, raucous voice was screaming angrily. Who are these friends of yours? What sort of people are they? To have the police there and a man shot, I've a good mind not to have you back at all. I can't have the tone of my establishment lowered. Midge made a few submissive, non-committal replies. She replaced the receiver at last with a sigh of relief. She felt sick and shaken. It's the place I work, she explained. I had to let them know that I wouldn't be back until Thursday because of the inquest and the police. Well, I hope they were decent about it. What is it like, this dress shop of yours? Is the woman who runs it pleasant and sympathetic to work for? I should hardly describe her as that. She's a Whitechapel princess, with dyed hair and a voice like a corncrake. <laughs> but, my dear Midge, Edward's face of consternation almost made Midge laugh. He was so concerned. But, my dear child, you can't put up with that sort of thing. If you must have a job, you must take one where the surroundings are harmonious and where you like the people you are working with. Midge looked at him for a moment, without answering. How to explain, she thought, to a person like Edward. What did Edward know of the labour market, of jobs? And suddenly a tide of bitterness rose in her. Lucy, Henry, Edward, yes, even Henrietta, they were all divided from her by an impassable gulf, the gulf that separates the leisured from the working. They had no conception of the difficulties of getting a job, and once you had got it, of keeping it. One might say, perhaps, that there was no need actually for her to earn a living. Lucy and Henry would gladly give her a home. They would with equal gladness have made her an allowance. Edward would also willingly have done the latter. But something in Midge rebelled against the acceptance of ease offered by her well-to-do relations. To come on rare occasions and sink into the well-ordered luxury of Lucy's life was delightful. She could revel in that. But some sturdy independence of spirit held her back from accepting that life as a gift. The same feeling had prevented her from starting a business on her own, with money borrowed from relations and friends. She had seen too much of that. She would borrow no money, use no influence. She had found a job for herself at four pounds a week, and if she had actually been given the job because Madame Alfrege hoped that Midge would bring her smart friends to buy, Madame Alfrege was disappointed. Midge discouraged any such notion sternly on the part of her friends. She had no particular illusions about working. She disliked the shop, she disliked Madame Alfrege, she disliked the eternal subservience to ill-tempered and impolite customers, but she doubted very much whether she could obtain any other job which she would like better, since she had none of the necessary qualifications. Edward's assumption that a wide range of choice was open to her was simply unbearably irritating this morning. What right had Edward to live in a world so divorced from reality? They were Angertels, all of them, and she was only half an Angertel, and sometimes, like this morning, she did not feel like an Angertel at all. She was all her father's daughter. She thought of her father with the usual pang of love and compunction, a grey-haired, middle-aged man with a tired face, a man who had struggled for years running a small family business that was bound, for all his care and efforts, to go slowly down the hill. It was not incapacity on his part, it was the march of progress. Strangely enough, it was not to her brilliant Angertel mother, but to her quiet, tired father that Midge's devotion had always been given. Each time, when she came back from those visits to Ainswick, which were the wild delight of her life, she would answer the faint, deprecating questions in her father's tired face by flinging her arms round his neck and saying, I'm glad to be home. I'm glad to be home. Her mother had died when Midge was thirteen. 
Sometimes Midge realized that she knew very little about her mother. She had been vague, charming, gay. Had she regretted her marriage, the marriage that had taken her outside the circle of the Angertel clan? Midge had no idea. Her father had grown greyer and quieter after his wife's death. His struggles against the extinction of his business had grown more unavailing. He had died quietly and inconspicuously when Midge was eighteen. Midge had stayed with various Angertel relations, had accepted presents from the Angertels, had had good times with the Angertels, but she had refused to be financially dependent on their goodwill, and much as she loved them, there were times such as these when she felt suddenly and violently divergent from them. She thought with rancour, they don't know anything. Edward, sensitive as always, was looking at her with a puzzled face. He asked gently, I've upset you. Why? Lucy drifted into the room. She was in the middle of one of her conversations. You see, one doesn't really know whether she'd prefer the White Hart to us or not. Midge looked at her blankly, then at Edward. It's no use looking at Edward, said Lady Angertel. Edward simply wouldn't know. You, Midge, are always so practical. I don't know what you're talking about, Lucy. Lucy looked surprised. The inquest, darling. Gerda has to come down for it. Should she stay here, or go to the White Hart? The associations here are painful, of course, but then at the White Hart there will be people who will stare and quantities of reporters. Wednesday, you know, at eleven, or is it eleven-thirty? A smile lit up Lady Angertel's face. I've never been to an inquest. I thought my grey, and a hat, of course, like church, but not gloves. You know, went on Lady Angertel, crossing the room and picking up the telephone receiver and gazing down at it earnestly, I don't believe I've got any gloves, except gardening gloves nowadays, and, of course, Lots of long evening ones, put away from the government house days. Gloves are rather stupid, don't you think so? The only use is to avoid fingerprints in crimes, said Edward, smiling. Now, it's very interesting you should say that, Edward, very interesting. What am I doing with this thing? Lady Angertel looked at the telephone receiver with faint distaste. Uh, were you going to ring up someone? I don't think so. Lady Angertel shook her head vaguely and put the receiver back on its stand, very gingerly. She looked from Edward to Midge. I don't think, Edward, that you ought to upset Midge. Midge minds sudden deaths more than we do. My dear Lucy, exclaimed Edward, I was only worrying about this place where Midge works. It sounds all wrong to me. Edward thinks I ought to have a delightful, sympathetic employer who would appreciate me, said Midge dryly. Dear Edward, said Lucy with complete appreciation. She smiled at Midge and went out again. Seriously, Midge, said Edward, I am worried. She interrupted him. That damned woman pays me four pounds a week. That's all that matters. She brushed past him and went out into the garden. Sir Henry was sitting in his usual place on the low wall, but Midge turned away and walked up towards the flower walk. Her relations were charming, but she had no use for their charm this morning. David Agatel was sitting on the seat at the top of the path. There was no overdone charm about David— and Midge made straight for him and sat down by him, noting with malicious pleasure his look of dismay. How extraordinarily difficult it was, thought David, to get away from people. He had been driven from his bedroom by the brisk incursion of housemaids, purposeful with mops and dusters. The library and the Encyclopaedia Britannica had not been the sanctuary he had hoped optimistically it might be. Twice Lady Angertel had drifted in and out, addressing him kindly with remarks to which there seemed no possible intelligent reply. He had come out here to brood upon his position. The mere weekend to which he had unwillingly committed himself had now lengthened out owing to the exigencies connected with sudden and violent death. David, who preferred the contemplation of an academic past or the earnest discussion of a left-wing future, had no aptitude for dealing with a violent and realistic present. As he had told Lady Angertel, he did not read the news of the world but now the news of the world seemed to have come to the hollow. Murder! David shuddered distastefully. What would his friends think? How did one, so to speak, take murder? What was one's attitude? Bored? Disgusted? Lightly amused? Trying to settle these problems in his mind, he was by no means pleased to be disturbed by Midge. He looked at her uneasily as she sat beside him. He was rather startled by the defiant stare with which she returned his look, a disagreeable girl of no intellectual value. She said, 
How do you like your relations? David shrugged his shoulders. He said, Does one really think about relations? Midge said, Does one really think about anything? Doubtless, David thought she didn't. He said, almost graciously, I was analysing my reactions to murder. It is certainly odd, said Midge, to be in one. David sighed and said, Wearisome. That was the best attitude. All the clichés that one thought only existed in the pages of detective fiction. You must be sorry you came, said Midge. David sighed. Yes, I might have been staying with a friend of mine in London, he added. He keeps a left-wing bookshop. I expect it's more comfortable here, said Midge. Does one really care about being comfortable? David asked scornfully. There are times, said Midge, when I feel I don't care about anything else. The pampered attitude to life, said David. If you were a worker— Midge interrupted him. I am a worker. That's why being comfortable is so attractive. Box beds, down pillows, early morning tea softly deposited beside the bed, a porcelain bath with lashings of hot water and delicious bath salts, the kind of easy chair you really sink into. Midge paused in her catalogue. The workers, said David, should have all these things. But he was a little doubtful about the softly deposited early morning tea which sounded impossibly sybaritic for an earnestly organised world. I couldn't agree with you more, said Midge heartily. Hercule Poirot, enjoying a mid-morning cup of chocolate, was interrupted by the ringing of the telephone. He got up and lifted the receiver. Allô? Monsieur Poirot? Lady Angertel? How nice of you to know my voice. Am I disturbing you? But not at all. You are, I hope— none the worse for the distressing events of yesterday. No, indeed. Distressing, as you say, but one feels, I find, quite detached. I rang you up to know if you could possibly come over. An imposition, I know, but I really am in great distress. But certainly, Lady Angertel. Did you mean now? Well, yes, I did mean now, as quickly as you can. That's very sweet of you. Not at all. I will come by the woods, then? Of course, the shortest way. Thank you so much, dear Monsieur Poirot. Pausing only to brush a few specks of dust off the lapels of his coat and to slip on a thin overcoat, Poirot crossed the lane and hurried along the path through the chestnuts. The swimming pool was deserted. The police had finished their work and gone. It looked innocent and peaceful in the soft, misty autumn light. Poirot took a quick look into the pavilion. The platinum fox cape, he noted, had been removed, but the six boxes of matches still stood upon the table by the settee. He wondered more than ever about those matches. It is not a place to keep matches, here in the damp. One box for convenience, perhaps, but not six. He frowned down on the painted iron table. The tray of glasses had been removed. Someone had scrawled with a pencil on the table, a rough design of a nightmarish tree. It pained Hercule Poirot. It offended his tidy mind. He clicked his tongue, shook his head, and hurried on towards the house, wondering at the reason for this urgent summons. Lady Angertel was waiting for him at the French windows, and swept him into the empty drawing-room. "'It was nice of you to come, Monsieur Poirot,' she clasped his hand warmly. "'Madame, I am at your service.' Lady Angertel's hands floated out expressively. Her wide, beautiful eyes opened. "'You see, it's all so difficult.' The inspector person is interviewing, no questioning, a, b, 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 taking a statement. What is the term they use? Gudgeon. And really, our whole life here depends on Gudgeon, and one does so sympathise with him, because naturally it is terrible to him to be questioned by the police, even Inspector Grange, who I do feel is really nice and probably a family man, boys, I think, and he helps them with Meccano in the evenings, and a wife who has everything spotless but a little overcrowded. Hercule Poirot blinked as Lady Angertel developed her imaginary sketch of Inspector Grange's home life. By the way his moustache droops, went on Lady Angertel, I think that a home that is too spotless might be sometimes depressing, like soap on hospital nurses' faces, quite a shine. But that is more in the country, where things lag behind. In London nursing homes they have lots of powder and really vivid lipstick. But I was saying, Monsieur Poirot, that you really must come to lunch properly when all this ridiculous business is over. You are very kind. I do not mind the police myself, said Lady Angertel. I really find it all quite interesting. Do let me help you in any way I can. I said to Inspector Grange, he seems rather a bewildered sort of person, but methodical. Motive seems so important to policemen, she went on. Talking of hospital nurses just now, I believe that John Christo, nurse with red hair and an upturned nose, quite attractive, 
But of course, it was a long time ago, and the police might not be interested. One doesn't really know how much poor Gerda had to put up with. She is the loyal type, don't you think? Or possibly she believes what is told her. I think if one has not a great deal of intelligence, it is wise to do that. Quite suddenly, Lady Angertel flung open the study door and ushered Poirot in, crying brightly, Here is Monsieur Poirot! She swept round him and out, shutting the door. Inspector Grange and Gudgeon were sitting by the desk. A young man with a notebook was in a corner. Gudgeon rose respectfully to his feet. Poirot hastened into apologies. I retire immediately. I assure you, I had no idea that Lady Angertel— uh, No, no, uh, you wouldn't have. Grange's moustache looked more pessimistic than ever this morning. Perhaps, thought Poirot, fascinated by Lady Angertel's recent sketch of Grange, there has been too much cleaning, or perhaps a Benares brass table has been purchased so that the good inspector, he really cannot have space to move. Angrily, he dismissed these thoughts. Inspector Grange's clean but overcrowded home, his wife, his boys, and their addiction to Meccano were all figments of Lady Angertel's busy brain. But the vividness with which they assumed concrete reality interested him. It was quite an accomplishment. "'Sit down, Monsieur Poirot,' said Grange. "'There is something I want to ask you about, and I've nearly finished here.' He turned his attention back to Gudgeon, who deferentially and almost under protest resumed his seat and turned an expressionless face towards his interlocutor. "'And that's all you can remember?' "'Yes, sir. Everything, sir, was very much as usual. There was no unpleasantness of any kind.' "'There's a fur cape thing out in that summer-house by the pool. Which of the ladies did it belong to?' "'Are you referring, sir, to a cape of platinum fox? I noticed it yesterday when I took out the glasses to the pavilion, but it is not the property of anyone in this house, sir.' Well, "'Whose is it, then?' "'It might possibly belong to Miss Cray, sir, Miss Veronica Cray, the motion-picture actress. She was wearing something of the kind.' "'When?' When she was here the night before last, sir. Well, you didn't mention her as having been a guest here. She was not a guest, sir. Miss Cray lives at Dovecote's, the uh, cottage up the lane, and she came over after dinner, having run out of matches, to borrow some. Did she take away six boxes? asked Poirot. Gudgeon turned to him. That is correct, sir. Her ladyship, after having inquired if we had plenty, insisted on Miss Cray's taking half a dozen boxes. "'Which she left in the pavilion,' said Poirot. "'Yes, sir. I observed them there yesterday morning.' "'There is not much that that man does not observe,' remarked Poirot, as Gudgeon departed, closing the door softly and deferentially behind him. Inspector Grange merely remarked that servants were the devil. "'However,' he said with a little renewed cheerfulness, "'there is always the kitchen-maid. Kitchen-maids talk. Not like these stuck-up upper servants.' "'I've put a man on to make inquiries at Arley Street,' he went on, "'and I shall be there myself later in the day. "'We ought to get something there. "'Dare say, you know, that wife of Christo's had a good bit to put up with. "'Some of these fashionable doctors and their lady patients. "'Well, you'd be surprised. "'And I gather from Lady Angertel that there was some trouble over a hospital nurse. "'Of course, she was very vague about it.' "'Yes,' Poirot agreed, "'she would be vague.' a skilfully built-up picture, John Christo and amorous intrigues with hospital nurses, the opportunities of a doctor's life, plenty of reasons for Gerda Christo's jealousy, which had culminated at last in murder. Yes, a skilfully suggested picture, drawing attention to a Harley Street background, away from the hollow, away from the moment when Henrietta Savernake, stepping forward, had taken the revolver from Gerda Christo's unresisting hand, away from that other moment when John Christo, dying, had said, Henrietta. Suddenly opening his eyes, which had been half-closed, Hercule Poirot demanded with irresistible curiosity, Do your boys play with Meccano? Aye. What? Inspector Grange came back from a frowning reverie to stare at Poirot. Why, what on earth? As a matter of fact, uh, they're a bit young. "'but I was thinking of giving Teddy a Meccano set for Christmas.' "'What made you ask?' Poirot shook his head. "'What made Lady Angertel dangerous,' he thought, "'was the fact that those intuitive, wild guesses of hers "'might be often right. "'With a careless, 
seemingly careless word, she built up a picture. And if part of the picture was right, wouldn't you, in spite of yourself, believe in the other half of the picture? Inspector Grange was speaking. There's a point I want to put to you, Monsieur Poirot. This Miss Cray, the actress, she traipses over here borrowing matches. If she wanted to borrow matches, why didn't she come to your place? Only a step or two away. Why come about half a mile? Hercule Poirot shrugged his shoulders. There might be reasons. Snob reasons, shall we say? My little cottage, it is small, unimportant. I am only a weekender. But Sir Henry and Lady Agatel are important. They live here. They are what is called in the country. This Miss Veronica Cray, she may have wanted to get to know them. And after all, this was a way. Inspector Grange got up. Yes, he said. That's perfectly possible, of course, but one doesn't want to overlook anything. Still, I've no doubt that everything's going to be plain sailing. Sir Henry has identified the gun as one of his collection. It seems they were actually practicing with it in the afternoon before. All Mrs. Christo had to do was to go into the study and get it, from where she'd seen Sir Henry put it and the ammunition away. It's all quite simple. Yes, Poirot murmured, it all seems quite simple. Just so, he thought, would a woman like Gerda Christo commit a crime, without subterfuge or complexity, driven suddenly to violence by the bitter anguish of a narrow but deeply loving nature. And yet surely, surely, she would have had some sense of self-preservation. Or had she acted in that blindness, that darkness of the spirit, when reason is entirely laid aside? He recalled her blank, dazed face. He did not know. He simply did not know. But he felt that he ought to know. Gerda Christo pulled the black dress up over her head and let it fall on a chair. Her eyes were piteous with uncertainty. She said, I don't know. I really don't know. Nothing seems to matter. I know, dear, I know. Mrs. Patterson was kind but firm. She knew exactly how to treat people who had had a bereavement. Elsie is wonderful in a crisis, her family said of her. At the present moment she was sitting in her sister Gerda's bedroom in Harley Street, being wonderful. Elsie Patterson was tall and spare, with an energetic manner. She was looking now at Gerda with a mixture of irritation and compassion. Poor dear Gerda! Tragic for her to lose her husband in such an awful way! And really, even now, she didn't seem to take in the, well, the implications properly. Of course, Mrs. Patterson reflected, Gerda always was terribly slow, and there was shock, too, to take into account. She said in a brisk voice, I think I should decide on that black marocaine at twelve guineas. One always did have to make up Gerda's mind for her. Gerda stood motionless, her brow puckered. She said hesitantly, I don't really know if John liked mourning. I think I once heard him say he didn't. John, she thought, if only John were here to tell me what to do. But John would never be there again. Never, never, never. Mutton getting cold, congealing on the table. The bang of the consulting room door. John running up two steps at a time, always in a hurry. So vital. So alive. Alive. Lying on his back by the swimming pool. The slow drip of blood over the edge the feel of the revolver in her hand. A nightmare, a bad dream. Presently she would wake up, and none of it would be true. Her sister's crisp voice came cutting through her nebulous thoughts. You must have something black for the inquest. It would look most odd if you turned up in bright blue. Gerda said, That awful inquest! And half shut her eyes. Terrible for you, darling, said Elsie Patterson quickly. But after it is all over, you will come straight down to us, and we shall take great care of you. The nebulous blur of Gerda Christo's thoughts hardened. She said, and her voice was frightened, almost panic-stricken, What am I going to do without John? Elsie Patterson knew the answer to that one. You've got your children. You've got to live for them. Zena, sobbing and crying, My daddy's dead! 
Throwing herself on her bed, Terry, pale, inquiring, shedding no tears. An accident with a revolver, she had told them. Poor Daddy has had an accident. Beryl Collins, so thoughtful of her, had confiscated the morning papers so that the children should not see them. She had warned the servants, too. Really, Beryl had been most kind and thoughtful. Terence coming to his mother in the dim drawing-room, his lips pursed close together, his face almost greenish in its odd pallor. Why was father shot? An accident, dear. I... I can't talk about it. It wasn't an accident. Why do you say what isn't true? Father was killed. It was murder. The paper says so. Terry, how did you get hold of a paper? I told Miss Collins... He had nodded. Queer, repeated nods, like a very old man. I went out and bought one, of course. I knew there must be something in them that you weren't telling us, or else why did Miss Collins hide them? It was never any good hiding truth from Terence. That queer, detached, scientific curiosity of his had always to be satisfied. Why was he killed, Mother? She had broken down then, becoming hysterical. Don't ask me about it. Don't talk about it. I can't talk about it. It's all too dreadful. But they'll find out, won't they? I mean, they have to find out. It's necessary. So reasonable, so detached, it made Gerda want to scream and laugh and cry. She thought, he doesn't care. He can't care. He just goes on asking questions. Why, he hasn't cried even. Terence had gone away, evading his Aunt Elsie's ministrations. A lonely little boy with a stiff, pinched face. He had always felt alone. But it hadn't mattered until today. Today he thought was different. If only there was someone who would answer questions reasonably and intelligently. Tomorrow, Tuesday, he and Nicholson Minor were going to make nitroglycerine. He had been looking forward to it with a thrill. The thrill had gone. He didn't care if he never made nitroglycerine. Terence felt almost shocked at himself, not to care any more about scientific experiment. But when a chap's father had been murdered, he thought— my father. Murdered. And something stirred, took root, grew, a slow anger. Beryl Collins tapped on the bedroom door and came in. She was pale, composed, efficient. She said, Inspector Grange is here. And as Gerda gasped and looked at her piteously, Beryl went on quickly. He said there was no need for him to worry you. He'll have a word with you before he goes. But it is just routine questions about Dr. Christo's practice, and I can tell him everything he wants to know. Oh, thank you, Collie. Beryl made a rapid exit, and Gerda sighed out. Collie is such a help. She's so practical. Yes, indeed, said Mrs. Patterson. An excellent secretary, I'm sure. A very plain poor girl, isn't she? Oh, well, I always think that's just as well, especially with an attractive man like John. Gerda flamed out at her. What do you mean, Elsie? John would never, he never, you talk as though John would have flirted or something horrid if he had had a pretty secretary. John wasn't like that at all. Of course not, darling, said Mrs. Patterson. But after all, one knows what men are like. In the consulting room, Inspector Grange faced the cool, belligerent glance of Beryl Collins. It was belligerent. He noted that. Well, perhaps that was only natural. Plain bit of goods, he thought. Nothing between her and the doctor, I shouldn't think. She may have been sweet on him. It works that way sometimes. But not this time, he came to the conclusion, when he leaned back in his chair a quarter of an hour later. Beryl Collins' answers to his questions had been models of clearness. She replied promptly, and obviously had every detail of the doctor's practice at her fingertips. He shifted his ground and began to probe gently into the relations existing between John Christo and his wife. They had been, Beryl said, on excellent terms. I suppose they quarrel every now and then, like most married couples? The inspector sounded easy and confidential. I do not remember any quarrels. Mrs. Christo was quite devoted to her husband, really quite slavishly so. There was a faint edge of contempt in her voice. Inspector Grange heard it. Bit of a feminist, this girl, he thought. Aloud, he said, Didn't stand up for herself at all? No. Everything revolved around Dr. Christo. 
tyrannical, eh? Beryl considered. No, I wouldn't say that. But he was what I should call a very selfish man. He took it for granted that Mrs. Christo would always fall in with his ideas. Any difficulties with patients? Uh, women, I mean? You needn't think about being frank, Miss Collins. One knows doctors have their difficulties in that line. Oh, that sort of thing. Beryl's voice was scornful. Dr. Christo was quite equal to dealing with any difficulties in that line. He had an excellent manner with patients, she added. He was really a wonderful doctor. There was an almost grudging admiration in her voice. Grange said, Was he tangled up with any woman? Don't be loyal, Miss Collins. It's important that we should know. Yes, I can appreciate that. Not to my knowledge. A little too brusque, he thought. She doesn't know, but perhaps she guesses. He said sharply, What about Miss Henrietta Savernake? Beryl's lips closed tightly. She was a close friend of the family's. No uh, trouble between Doctor and Mrs. Christo on her account? Certainly not. The answer was emphatic. Over-emphatic? The inspector shifted his ground. What about Miss Veronica Cray? Veronica Cray? There was pure astonishment in Beryl's voice. She was a friend of Dr. Christo's, was she not? I never heard of her. At least, I seem to know the name. The motion picture actress. Beryl's brow cleared. Oh, of course. I wondered why the name was familiar, but I didn't even know that Dr. Christo knew her. She seemed so positive on the point that the inspector abandoned it at once. He went on to question her about Dr. Christo's manner on the preceding Saturday, and here, for the first time, the confidence of Beryl's replies wavered. She said slowly, "'His manner wasn't quite as usual. What was the difference? He seemed distray. There was quite a long gap before he rang for his last patient, and yet normally he was always in a hurry to get through when he was going away. I thought, yes, I definitely thought he had something on his mind.' but she could not be more definite. Inspector Grange was not very satisfied with his investigations. He'd come nowhere near establishing motive, and motive had to be established before there was a case to go to the public prosecutor. He was quite certain in his own mind that Gerda Christo had shot her husband. He suspected jealousy as the motive, but so far he had found nothing to go on. Sergeant Coombs had been working on the maids, but they all told the same story. Mrs. Christo worshipped the ground her husband walked on. Whatever happened, he thought, must have happened down at the hollow, and remembering the hollow, he felt a vague disquietude. They were an odd lot down there. The telephone on the desk rang, and Miss Collins picked up the receiver. She said, "'It's for you, Inspector,' and passed the instrument to him. "'Hello? Grange here. What's that?' Beryl heard the alteration in his tone, and looked at him curiously. The wooden-looking face was impassive as ever. He was grunting, listening. Yeah, 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 I've got that. Oh, that's absolutely certain, is it? No margin of error? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll be down. I've about finished here. Yes. He put the receiver back and sat for a moment motionless. Beryl looked at him curiously. He pulled himself together and asked in a voice that was quite different from the voice of his previous questions— You've no ideas of your own, I suppose, Miss Collins, about this matter? You mean, I mean no ideas as to who it was killed Dr. Christo, she said flatly. I've absolutely no idea at all, Inspector, Grange said slowly. When the body was found, Mrs. Christo was standing beside it with the revolver in her hand. He left it purposely as an unfinished sentence. Her reaction came promptly, not heated, cool and judicial. If you think Mrs. Christo killed her husband, I am quite sure you are wrong. Mrs. Christo is not at all a violent woman. She is very meek and submissive, and she was entirely under the doctor's thumb. It seems to me quite ridiculous that anyone could imagine for a moment that she shot him, however much appearances may be against her. Then if she didn't, who did? he asked sharply. Beryl said slowly, I've no idea. The inspector moved to the door. Beryl asked, Do you want to see Mrs. Christo before you go? Uh, no, oh, yes, perhaps I'd better. Again, Beryl wondered. 
This was not the same man who had been questioning her before the telephone rang. What news had he got that had altered him so much? Gerda came into the room nervously. She looked unhappy and bewildered. She said in a low, shaky voice, "'Have you found out any more about who killed John?' "'Not yet, Mrs. Christo. "'It's so impossible, so absolutely impossible. "'But it happened, Mrs. Christo. "'She nodded, looking down, screwing a handkerchief into a little ball. "'He said quietly, "'Had your husband any enemies, Mrs. Christo? "'John? Oh, no. He was wonderful. Everyone adored him. "'You can't think of anyone who had a grudge against him?' he paused. "'Or against you?' against me? She seemed amazed. Oh, no, Inspector. Inspector Grange sighed. What about Miss Veronica Cray? Veronica Cray? Oh, you mean the one who came that night to borrow matches? Yes, that's the one. You knew her? Gerda shook her head. I'd never seen her before. John knew her years ago, or so she said. I suppose she might have had a grudge against him that you didn't know about. Gerda said with dignity, I don't believe anybody could have had a grudge against John. He was the kindest and most unselfish, oh, and one of the noblest men. Hmm, said the inspector. Yes, quite so. Well, good morning, Mrs. Christo. You understand about the inquest. Eleven o'clock Wednesday in Market de Pleach. It will be very simple, nothing to upset you. Probably be adjourned for a week so that we can make further inquiries. Oh, I see. Thank you. She stood there staring after him. He wondered whether, even now, she had grasped the fact that she was the principal suspect. He hailed a taxi. Justifiable expense in view of the piece of information he had just been given over the telephone. Just where that piece of information was leading him, he did not know. On the face of it, it seemed completely irrelevant. Crazy. It simply did not make sense, yet in some way he could not yet see. It must make sense. The only inference to be drawn from it was that the case was not quite the simple, straightforward one that he had hitherto assumed it to be. Sir Henry stared curiously at Inspector Grange. He said slowly, "'I'm not quite sure that I understand you, Inspector.' It's quite simple, Sir Henry. I'm asking you to check over your collection of firearms. I presume they are catalogued and indexed? Well, naturally. But I have already identified the revolver as part of my collection. It isn't quite so simple as that, Sir Henry. Grange paused a moment. His instincts were always against giving out any information, but his hand was being forced in this particular instance. Sir Henry was a person of importance— he would doubtless comply with the request that was being made of him, but he would also require a reason. The inspector decided that he had got to give him the reason. He said quietly, Dr. Christo was not shot with the revolver you identified this morning. Sir Henry's eyebrows rose. Remarkable, he said. Grange felt vaguely comforted. Remarkable was exactly what he felt himself. He was grateful to Sir Henry for saying so, and equally grateful for his not saying any more. It was as far as they could go at the moment. The thing was remarkable, and beyond that simply did not make sense. Sir Henry asked, "'Have you any reason to believe that the weapon from which the fatal shot was fired comes from my collection?' "'No reason at all, but I have to make sure, shall we say, that it doesn't.' Sir Henry nodded his head in confirmation. "'I appreciate your point.' Well, we will get to work. It will take a little time. He opened the desk and took out a leather-bound volume. As he opened it, he repeated, It will take a little time to check up. Grange's attention was held by something in his voice. He looked up sharply. Sir Henry's shoulders sagged a little. He seemed suddenly an older and more tired man. Inspector Grange frowned. He thought, Devil if I know what to make of these people down here. Ah! Grange spun round. His eyes noted the time by the clock. Thirty minutes? Twenty minutes, since Sir Henry had said, it will take a little time. Grange said sharply, Yes, sir? A thirty-eight Smith and Wesson is missing. It was in a brown leather holster, and was at the end of the rack in this drawer. Ah! The inspector kept his voice calm, but he was excited, 
And when, sir, to your certain knowledge, did you last see it in its proper place? Sir Henry reflected for a moment or two. That is not very easy to say, Inspector. I last had this drawer open about a week ago, I think. And uh, I'm almost certain that if the revolver had been missing then, I should have noticed the gap. But I should not like to swear definitely that I saw it there. Inspector Grange nodded his head. Thank you, sir. I quite understand. Well, I must be getting on with things. He left the room, a busy, purposeful man. Sir Henry stood motionless for a while after the inspector had gone. Then he went out slowly through the French windows onto the terrace. His wife was busy with a gardening basket and gloves. She was pruning some rare shrubs with a pair of secateurs. She waved to him brightly. What did the inspector want? I hope he's not going to worry the servants again. You know, Henry, they don't like it. They can't see it as amusing or as a novelty like we do. Do we see it like that? His tone attracted her attention. She smiled up at him sweetly. How tired you look, Henry. Must you let all this worry you so much? Murder is worrying, Lucy. Lady Angertel considered a moment, absently clipping off some branches. Then her face clouded over. Oh, dear, that is the worst of secateurs. They're so fascinating one can't stop, and one always clips off more than one means. What was it you were saying? Something about murder being worrying? But really, Henry, I've never seen why. I mean, if one has to die, it may be cancer or tuberculosis in one of those dreadful bright sanatoriums or a stroke. Horrid, <laughs> with one's face all on one side, or else one is shot or stabbed or strangled, perhaps. But the whole thing comes to the same in the end. There one is, I mean, dead, out of it all, and all the worry's over. And the relations have all the difficulties, money quarrels and whether to wear black or not, and who was to have Aunt Selina's writing desk, things like that. Sir Henry sat down on the stone coping, he said. This is all going to be more upsetting than we thought, Lucy. Well, darling, we shall have to bear it, and when it's all over we might go away somewhere. Let's not bother about present troubles, but look forward to the future. I really am happy about that. I've been wondering whether it would be nice to go to Ainswick for Christmas, or leave it until Easter. What do you think? Plenty of time to make plans for Christmas. Yes, but I'd like to see things in my mind. Easter, perhaps. Yes, Lucy smiled happily. She will certainly have got over it by then. Who? Sir Henry was startled. Lady Angertel said calmly, Henrietta, I think if they were to have the wedding in October, October of next year, I mean, then we could go and stop for that Christmas. I've been thinking, Henry, I wish you wouldn't, my dear. You think too much. You know the barn. It'll make a perfect studio, and Henrietta will need a studio. She has real talent, you know. Edward, I'm sure, will be immensely proud of her. Two boys and a girl would be nice, or two boys and two girls. Lucy, Lucy, how you run on. But, darling, Lady Angertel opened wide, beautiful eyes. Edward will never marry anyone but Henrietta. He is very, very obstinate. Rather like my father in that way. He gets an idea in his head. So, of course, Henrietta must marry him. And she will, now that John Christo is out of the way. He was really the greatest misfortune that could possibly have happened to her. Poor devil. Why? Oh, you mean because he's dead? Oh, well, everyone has to die sometime. I never worry over people dying. He looked at her curiously. I always thought you liked Christo, Lucy. I found him amusing, and he had charm, but I never think one ought to attach too much importance to anybody. And gently, with a smiling face, Lady Angertel clipped remorselessly at a viburnum carlesii. Hercule Poirot looked out of his window and saw Henrietta Savernake walking up the path to the front door. She was wearing the same green tweeds that she had worn on the day of the tragedy. There was a spaniel with her. He hastened to the front door and opened it. She stood smiling at him. "'Can I come in and see your house? I like looking at people's houses. I'm just taking the dog for a walk. But most certainly, how English it is to take the dog for a walk.' "'I know,' said Henrietta. "'I thought of that. Do you know that nice poem? The days passed slowly, one by one. I fed the ducks, reproved my wife, played Handel's Largo on the fife, and took the dog a run.' Again she smiled, a brilliant, insubstantial smile. Poirot ushered her into his sitting-room. She looked round its neat and prim arrangement and nodded her head. Nice, she said. Two of everything. How you would hate my studio. Why should I hate it? Oh, a lot of clay sticking to things, and here and there just one thing that I happen to like, and which would be ruined if there were two of them. But I can understand that, mademoiselle. You are an artist. Aren't you an artist too, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot put his head on one side. He 
it is a question that, but on the whole I would say no. I have known crimes that were artistic. They were, you understand, supreme exercises of imagination. But the solving of them, no. It is not the creative power that is needed. What is required is a passion for the truth. A passion for the truth, said Henrietta meditatively. Yes, I can see how dangerous that might make you. Would the truth satisfy you? He looked at her curiously. What do you mean, Miss Savernick? I can understand that you would want to know, but would knowledge be enough? Would you have to go a step further and translate knowledge into action? He was interested in her approach. You are suggesting that if I knew the truth about Dr. Christo's death, I might be satisfied to keep that knowledge to myself. Do you know the truth about his death? Henrietta shrugged her shoulders. The obvious answer seems to be Gerda. How cynical it is that a wife or a husband is always the first suspect. But you do not agree. I always like to keep an open mind. Poirot said quietly, Why did you come here, Miss Savernick? I must admit that I haven't your passion for truth, Monsieur Poirot. Taking the dog for a walk was such a nice English countryside excuse. But of course the Angatels haven't got a dog, as you may have noticed the other day. The fact had not escaped me. So I borrowed the gardener's spaniel. I am not, you must understand, Monsieur Poirot, very truthful. Again that brilliant, brittle smile flashed out. He wondered why he should suddenly find it unendurably moving. He said quietly, No, but you have integrity. Why on earth do you say that? She was startled, almost, he thought, dismayed. Because I believe it to be true. Integrity, Henrietta repeated thoughtfully. I wonder what that word really means. She sat very still, staring down at the carpet. Then she raised her head and looked at him steadily. Don't you want to know why I did come? You find a difficulty, perhaps, in putting it into words. Yes, I, I think I do. The inquest, Monsieur Poirot, is tomorrow. One has to make up one's mind just how much— She broke off. Getting up, she wandered across to the mantelpiece, displaced one or two of the ornaments, and moved a vase of Michaelmas daisies from its position in the middle of a table to the extreme corner of the mantelpiece. She stepped back, eyeing the arrangement, with her head on one side. How do you like that, Monsieur Poirot? Not at all, mademoiselle. I thought you wouldn't. She laughed, moved everything quickly and deftly back into its original position. Well, if one wants to say a thing, one has to say it. You are somehow the sort of person one can talk to. Here goes. Is it necessary, do you think, that the police should know that I was John Christo's mistress? Her voice was quite dry and unemotional. She was looking not at him, but at the wall over his head. With one forefinger she was following the curve of the jar that held the purple flowers. He had an idea that in the touch of that finger was her emotional outlet. Hercule Poirot said precisely, and also without emotion, I see. You were lovers. If you prefer to put it like that. He looked at her curiously. It was not how you put it, mademoiselle. No. Why not? Henrietta shrugged her shoulders. She came and sat down by him on the sofa. She said slowly, One likes to describe things as, as accurately as possible. His interest in Henrietta Savonet grew stronger. He said, You had been Dr. Christo's mistress for how long? About six months. The police will have, I gather, no difficulty in discovering the fact. Henrietta considered, I imagine not. That is, if they are looking for something of that kind. Oh, they will be looking. I can assure you of that. Yes, I rather thought they would. She paused, stretched out her fingers on her knee and looked at them, then gave him a swift, friendly glance. Well, Monsieur Poirot, what does one do? Go to Inspector Grange and say, What does one say to a moustache like that? It's such a domestic family moustache. Poirot's hand crawled upwards to his own proudly born adornment. Whereas mine, mademoiselle? Your moustache, Monsieur Poirot, is an artistic triumph. It has no associations with anything but itself. It is, I am sure, unique. Absolutely. And it is probably the reason why I am talking to you as I am. Granted that the police have to know the truth about John and myself, 
Will it necessarily have to be made public? Uh, that depends, said Poirot. If the police think it has no bearing on the case, they will be quite discreet. You are very anxious on this point? Henrietta nodded. She stared down at her fingers for a moment or two, then suddenly lifted her head and spoke. Her voice was no longer dry and light. Why should things be made worse than they are for poor Gerda? She adored John, and he's dead. She's lost him. Why should she have to bear an added burden? It is for her that you mind? Do you think that is hypocritical? I suppose you're thinking that if I cared at all about Gerda's peace of mind, I would never have become John's mistress. But you don't understand. It was not like that. I did not break up his married life. I was only one of a procession. Ah, it was like that. She turned on him sharply. No, 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 not what you're thinking. That is what I mind most of all, the false idea that everybody will have of what John was like. That's why I'm here talking to you, because I've got a vague, foggy hope that I can make you understand. Understand, I mean, the sort of person John was. I can see so well what will happen, the headlines in the papers, a doctor's love life, Gerda, myself, Veronica, Cray. John wasn't like that. He wasn't, actually, a man who thought much about women. It wasn't women who mattered to him most. It was his work. It was in his work that his interest and excitement, yes, and his sense of adventure, really lay. If John had been taken unawares at any moment and asked to name the woman who was most in his mind, do you know who he would have said? Mrs. Crabtree. Mrs. Crabtree? Poirot was surprised. Who then is this uh, Mrs. Crabtree? There was something between tears and laughter in Henrietta's voice as she went on. She's an old woman, ugly, dirty, wrinkled, quite indomitable. John thought the world of her. She's a patient in St. Christopher's Hospital. She's got Ridgway's disease. That's a disease that's very rare, but if you get it, you're bound to die. There isn't any cure, but John was finding a cure. I can't explain technically. It was all very complicated, some question of hormone secretions. He'd been making experiments, and Mrs. Crabtree was his prized patient. You see, she's got guts. She wants to live. And she was fond of John. She and he were fighting on the same side. Ridgway's disease and Mrs. Crabtree is what has been uppermost in John's mind for months, night and day. Nothing else really counted. That's what being the kind of doctor John was really means. Not all the Harley Street stuff and the rich, fat women. That's only a sideline. It's the intense scientific curiosity and the achievement. I... Oh, I wish I could make you understand. Her hands flew out in a curiously despairing gesture, and Hercule Poirot thought how very lovely and sensitive those hands were. He said, You seem to understand very well. Oh, yes, I understood. John used to come and talk, do you see? Not quite to me. Partly, I think, to himself. He got things clear that way. Sometimes he was almost despairing. He couldn't see how to overcome the heightened toxicity, and then he'd get an idea for varying the treatment. I can't explain to you what it was like. It was like, yes, a, a battle. You can't imagine the, the fury of it and the concentration, and yes, sometimes the agony, and sometimes the sheer tiredness. She was silent for a minute or two, her eyes dark with remembrance. Poirot said curiously, you must have a certain technical knowledge yourself. She shook her head. <laughs> Not really. Only enough to understand what John was talking about. I got books and read about it. She was silent again. Her face softened, her lips half parted. She was, he thought, remembering. With a sigh, her mind came back to the present. She looked at him wistfully. If only I could make you see. But you have, mademoiselle. Really? Yes, one recognizes authenticity when one hears it. Thank you. But it won't be so easy to explain to expect a Grange. Probably not. He will concentrate on the personal angle. Henrietta said vehemently. And that was so unimportant, so completely unimportant. Poirot's eyebrows rose slowly. She answered his unspoken protest. But it was. You see, after a while... I got between John and what he was thinking of. I affected him as a woman. He couldn't concentrate as he wanted to concentrate. Because of me, he began to be afraid that he was beginning to love me. He didn't want to love anyone. He made love to me because he didn't want to think about me too much. He wanted it to be light, easy, just an affair, like other affairs that he had had. And you? Poirot was watching her closely. You were content to have it like that? 
Henrietta got up. She said, and once more it was her dry voice, No, I wasn't content. After all, one is human. Poirot waited a minute. Then he said, Then why, mademoiselle, why? She whirled round on him. I wanted John to be satisfied. I wanted John to have what he wanted. I wanted him to be able to go on with the thing he cared about, his work. If he didn't want to be hurt, to be vulnerable again, why, why, that was all right by me. Poirot rubbed his nose. Just now, Miss Savernick, you mentioned Veronica Cray. Was she also a friend of John Christo's? Until last Saturday night he hadn't seen her for fifteen years. He knew her fifteen years ago. They were engaged to be married. Henrietta came back and sat down. I see I've got to make it all clearer. John loved Veronica desperately. Veronica was, and is, a bitch of the first water. She's the supreme egoist. Her terms were that John was to chuck everything he cared about and become Miss Veronica Cray's little tame husband. John broke up the whole thing quite rightly. He suffered like hell. His one idea was to marry someone as unlike Veronica as possible. He married Gerda, whom you might describe inelegantly as a first-class chump. That was all very nice and safe, but as anyone could have told him, the day came when being married to a chump irritated him. He had various affairs, none of them important. Gerda, of course, never knew about them. But I think, myself, that for fifteen years there has been something wrong with John, something connected with Veronica. He never really got over her. And then last Saturday he met her again. After a long pause, Poirot recited dreamily, He went out with her that night to see her home, and returned to the hollow at three a.m. How do you know? A housemaid had the toothache. Henrietta said, Lucy has far too many servants. But you yourself knew that, mademoiselle? Yes. How did you know? Again there was an infinitesimal pause. Then Henrietta replied slowly, I was looking out of my window and saw him come back to the house. The toothache, mademoiselle? She smiled at him. Quite another kind of ache, Monsieur Poirot. She got up and moved towards the door, and Poirot said, I will walk back with you, mademoiselle. They crossed the lane and went through the gate into the chestnut plantation. Henrietta said, We need not go past the pool. We can go up to the left and along the top path to the flower walk. A track led steeply uphill towards the woods. After a while they came to a broader path at right angles across the hillside above the chestnut trees. Presently they came to a bench, and Henrietta sat down, Poirot beside her. The woods were above and behind them, and below were the closely planted chestnut groves. Just in front of the seat a curving path led downwards to where just a glimmer of blue water could be seen. Poirot watched Henrietta without speaking. Her face had relaxed. The tension had gone. It looked rounder and younger. He realized what she must have looked like as a young girl. He said very gently at last, Of what are you thinking, mademoiselle? Of Ainswick. What is Ainswick? Ainswick? It's a place. Almost dreamily she described Ainswick to him. The white, graceful house, the big magnolia growing up it, the whole set in an amphitheatre of wooded hills. It was your home? Not really. I lived in Ireland. It was where we came, all of us, for holidays, Edward and Midge and myself. It was Lucy's home, actually. It belonged to her father. After his death it came to Edward. Not to Sir Henry? But it is he who has the title. Oh, that's a KCB, she explained. Henry was only a distant cousin. And after Edward Angertel, to whom does it go, this Enswick? How odd! I've never really thought. If Edward doesn't marry— She paused. A shadow passed over her face. Hercule Poirot wondered exactly what thought was passing through her mind. I suppose, said Henrietta slowly, it will go to David. So that's why. Why what? Why Lucy asked him here. David— and Ainswick. She shook her head. They don't fit somehow. Poirot pointed to the path in front of them. 
It is by that path, mademoiselle, that you went down to the swimming pool yesterday. She gave a quick shiver. No, by the one nearer the house. It was Edward who came this way. She turned on him suddenly. Must we talk about it any more? I hate the swimming pool. I even hate the hollow. Poirot murmured. I hate the dreadful hollow behind the little wood. Its lips in the field above are dabbled with blood-red heath. The red-ribbed ledges drip with a silent horror of blood, and echo there whatever is asked her answers death. Henrietta turned an astonished face on him. Tennyson, said Hercule Poirot, nodding his head proudly, the poetry of your Lord Tennyson. Henrietta was repeating, and echo there whatever is asked her. She went on, almost to herself. But of course— I see. That's what it is. Echo. How do you mean, echo? This place, the hollow itself. I almost saw it before, on Saturday, when Edward and I walked up to the ridge. An echo of Ainswick. And that's what we are. We Angertels. Echoes. We're not real. Not real as John was real. She turned to Poirot. I wish you had known him, Monsieur Poirot. We're all shadows compared to John. John was really alive. I knew that even when he was dying, mademoiselle. I know, one felt it. And John is dead. And we, the echoes, are alive. It's like, you know, a very bad joke. The youth had gone from her face again. Her lips were twisted, bitter with sudden pain. When Poirot spoke, asking a question, she did not for a moment take in what he was saying. I'm sorry? What did you say, Monsieur Poirot? I was asking whether your aunt, Lady Angertel, liked Dr. Christo. Lucy? She is a cousin, by the way, not an aunt. Yes, she liked him very much. And you're also a cousin, uh, Mr. Edward Angertel? Did he like Dr. Christo? Her voice was, he thought, a little constrained, as she replied, Not particularly, but then he hardly knew him. And you're yet another cousin, Mr. David Angertel? Henrietta smiled. David, I think, hates all of us. He spends his time immured in the library, reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. Ah, a serious temperament. I am sorry for David. He has had a difficult home life. His mother was unbalanced, an invalid. Now his only way of protecting himself is to try to feel superior to everyone. It's all right as long as it works, but now and then it breaks down, and the vulnerable David peeps through. Did he feel himself superior to Dr. Christo? He tried to, but I don't think it came off. I suspect that John Christo was just the kind of man that David would like to be. He disliked John, in consequence. Poirot nodded his head thoughtfully. Yes, self-assurance, confidence, virility, all the intensive male qualities. It is interesting, very interesting. Henrietta did not answer. Through the chestnuts down by the pool, Hercule Poirot saw a man stooping, searching for something, or so it seemed. He murmured, I wonder. I beg your pardon? Poirot said, That is one of Inspector Grange's men. He seems to be looking for something. Clues, I suppose. Don't policemen look for clues? Cigarette ash, footprints, burnt matches? Her voice held a kind of bitter mockery. Poirot answered seriously, Yes, they look for these things, and sometimes they find them. But the real clues, Miss Savernick, in a case like this, usually lie in the personal relationships of the people concerned. I don't think I understand you. Little things, said Poirot, his head thrown back, his eyes half closed. Not a cigarette ash or a rubber heel mark, but a gesture, a look, an unexpected action. Henrietta turned her head sharply to look at him. He felt her eyes, but he did not turn his head. She said, are you thinking of anything in particular? I was thinking of how you stepped forward and took the revolver out of Mrs. Christo's hand, then dropped it in the pool. He felt the slight start she gave, but her voice was quite normal and calm. Gerda, Monsieur Poirot, is a rather clumsy person. In the shock of the moment, and if the revolver had had another cartridge in it, she might have fired it and hurt someone. But it was rather clumsy of you, was it not, to drop it in the pool? Well, I had had a shock, too, she paused. 
What are you suggesting, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot sat up, turned his head, and spoke in a brisk, matter-of-fact way. If there were fingerprints on that revolver, that is to say, fingerprints made before Mrs. Cristo handled it, it would be interesting to know whose they were, and that we shall never know now. Henrietta said quietly but steadily, Meaning that you think they were mine? You are suggesting that I shot John, and then left the revolver beside him, so that Gerda could come along and pick it up, and be left holding the baby? That is what you are suggesting, isn't it? But surely, if I did that, you will give me credit for enough intelligence to have wiped off my own fingerprints first. But surely you are intelligent enough to see, mademoiselle, that if you had done so, and if the revolver had had no fingerprints on it but Mrs. Christo's, that would have been very remarkable, for you were all shooting with that revolver the day before. Gerda Christo would hardly have wiped the revolver clean of fingerprints before using it. Why should she? Henrietta said slowly, so you think I killed John? When Dr. Christo was dying, he said, Henrietta. And you think that that was an accusation? It was not. What was it then? Henrietta stretched out her foot and traced a pattern with the toe. She said in a low voice, Aren't you forgetting what I told you not very long ago? I mean, the terms we were on. Ah, yes. He was your lover. And so, as he is dying, he says, Henrietta, that is very touching. She turned blazing eyes upon him. Must you sneer? I am not sneering. But I do not like being lied to, and that, I think, is what you are trying to do, Henrietta said quietly. I have told you that I am not very truthful. But when John said, Henrietta, he was not accusing me of having murdered him. Can't you understand that people of my kind who make things are quite incapable of taking life? I don't kill people, Monsieur Poirot. I couldn't kill anyone. That's the plain, stark truth. You suspect me simply because my name was murmured by a dying man who hardly knew what he was saying. Dr. Christo knew perfectly well what he was saying. His voice was as alive and conscious as that of a doctor doing a vital operation who says sharply and urgently, Nurse the forceps, please. But she seemed at a loss. Taken aback, Hercule Poirot went on rapidly, and it is not just on account of what Dr. Christo said when he was dying. I do not believe for one moment that you are capable of premeditated murder. That, no. But you might have fired that shot in a sudden moment of fierce resentment. And if so, if so, mademoiselle, you have the creative imagination and ability to cover your tracks. Henrietta got up. She stood for a moment, pale and shaken, looking at him. She said with a sudden, rueful smile, and I thought you liked me. Hercule Poirot sighed. He said sadly, That is what is so unfortunate for me. I do. When Henrietta had left him, Poirot sat on until he saw below him Inspector Grange walk past the pool with a resolute, easy stride and take the path on past the pavilion. The inspector was walking in a purposeful way. He must be going, therefore, either to Rest Haven or to Duffcoats. Poirot wondered which. He got up and retraced his steps along the way he had come. If Inspector Grange was coming to see him, he was interested to hear what the inspector had to say. But when he got back to Rest Haven, there was no sign of a visitor. Poirot looked thoughtfully up the lane in the direction of Duffcoats. Veronica Cray had not, he knew, gone back to London. He found his curiosity rising about Veronica Cray, the pale, shining fox furs, the heaped boxes of matches, that sudden, imperfectly explained invasion on the Saturday night, and finally Henrietta Savonake's revelations about John Christo and Veronica. It was, he thought, an interesting pattern. Yes, that was how he saw it, a pattern, a design of intermingled emotions and the clash of personalities, a strange, involved design with dark threads of hate and desire running through it, had Gerda Christo shot her husband? Or was it not quite so simple as that? He thought of his conversation with Henrietta, and decided that it was not so simple. Henrietta had jumped to the conclusion that he suspected her of the murder, but actually he had not gone nearly as far as that in his mind. No further, indeed, than the belief that Henrietta knew something, knew something, or was concealing something. Which? He shook his head, dissatisfied the scene by the pool, a set scene, 
A stage scene, staged by whom? Staged for whom? The answer to the second question was he strongly suspected Hercule Poirot. He had thought so at the time, but he had thought then that it was an impertinence, a, a joke. It still was an impertinence, but not a joke. And the answer to the first question? He shook his head. He did not know. He had not the least idea. But he half closed his eyes and conjured them up, all of them, seeing them clearly in his mind's eye. Sir Henry, upright, responsible, trusted administrator of empire. Lady Angertel, shadowy, elusive, unexpectedly and bewilderingly charming, with that deadly power of inconsequent suggestion. Henrietta Savernake, who had loved John Christo better than she loved herself. The gentle and negative Edward Angertel, the dark, positive girl called Midge Hardcastle, the dazed, bewildered face of Gerda Christo clasping a revolver in her hand, the offended adolescent personality of David Angertel. There they all were, caught and held in the meshes of the law, bound together for a little while in the relentless aftermath of sudden and violent death. Each of them had their own tragedy and meaning, their own story. And somewhere in that interplay of characters and emotions lay the truth. To Hercule Poirot there was only one thing more fascinating than the study of human beings, and that was the pursuit of truth. He meant to know the truth of John Christo's death. Oh, but of course, Inspector, said Veronica, I'm only too anxious to help you. Thank you, Miss Cray. Veronica Cray was not somehow at all what the Inspector had imagined. He had been prepared for glamour, for artificiality, even possibly for heroics. He would not have been at all surprised if she had put on an act of some kind. In fact, she was, he shrewdly suspected, putting on an act. But it was not the kind of act he had expected. There was no overdone feminine charm. Glamour was not stressed. Instead, he felt that he was sitting opposite to an exceedingly good-looking and expensively dressed woman who was also a good businesswoman. Veronica Cray, he thought, was no fool. We just want a clear statement, Miss Cray. You came over to the hollow on Saturday evening. Yes, I'd run out of matches. One forgets how important these things are in the country. You went all the way to the hollow? Why not to your next-door neighbour, Monsieur Poirot? She smiled, a superb, confident camera smile. I didn't know who my next-door neighbour was, otherwise I should have. I just thought he was some little foreigner, and I thought, you know, he might become a bore, living so near. Yes, thought Grange. Quite plausible. She'd worked that out, ready for the occasion. You got your matches, he said, and you recognised an old friend in Dr. Christo, I understand. She nodded. Poor John. Yes, I hadn't seen him for fifteen years. Really? There was polite disbelief in the inspector's tone. Really? Her tone was firmly assertive. You were pleased to see him? Very pleased. It's always delightful, don't you think, Inspector, to come across an old friend? It can be, on some occasions. Veronica Cray went on without waiting for further questioning. John saw me home. You'll want to know if he said anything that could have a bearing on the tragedy, and I've been thinking over our conversation very carefully, but really, there wasn't a pointer of any kind. What did you talk about, Miss Cray? Old days. Do you remember this, that, and the other? She smiled pensively. We had known each other in the south of France. John had really changed very little. Older, of course, and more assured. I gather he was quite well known in his profession. He didn't talk about his personal life at all. I just got the impression that his married life wasn't perhaps frightfully happy, but it was only the vaguest impression. I suppose his wife, poor thing, was one of those dim, jealous women, probably always making a fuss about his better-looking lady patients. No, said Grange. She doesn't really seem to have been that way, Veronica said quickly. You mean, it was all underneath? Yes, yes, I can see that would be far more dangerous. I see you think Mrs. Christo shot him, Miss Cray. I oughtn't to have said that. One mustn't comment. Is that it, before a trial? I'm extremely sorry, Inspector. It was just that my maid told me she'd been found actually standing over the body with the revolver still in her hand. You know, in these quiet country places everything gets so exaggerated, and servants do pass things on. Servants can be very useful sometimes, Miss Cray. 
"'Yes, I suppose you get a lot of your information that way,' Grange went on stolidly. "'It's a question, of course, of who had a motive,' he paused. Veronica said with a faint, rueful smile, "'And a wife is always the first suspect? How cynical. But there's usually what's called the other woman. I suppose she might be considered to have had a motive, too.' "'You think there was another woman in Dr. Christo's life?' "'Well, yes. I did rather imagine there might be. One just gets an impression, you know.' "'Impressions can be very helpful sometimes,' said Grange. "'I rather imagined, from what he said, that that sculptress woman was, uh, well, uh, a very close friend. But I expect you know all about that already. We have to look into all these things, of course.' Inspector Grange's voice was strictly non-committal, but he saw, without appearing to see, a quick spiteful flash of satisfaction in those large blue eyes. He said, making the question very official, "'Dr. Christo saw you home, you say. What time was it when you said good-night to him?' "'Do you know? I really can't remember. We talked for some time. I do know that. It must have been quite late. He came in? Yes, I gave him a drink. I see.' I imagined your conversation might have taken place in the uh, pavilion by the swimming pool. He saw her eyelids flicker. There was hardly a moment's hesitation before she said, You really are a detective, aren't you? Yes, we sat there and smoked and talked for some time. How did you know? Her face bore the pleased, eager expression of a child asking to be shown a clever trick. You left your furs behind there, Miss Cray, he added, just without emphasis. "'And the matches. "'Yes, of course I did. "'Dr. Christo returned to the hollow at 3 a.m.' "'announced the inspector, again without emphasis. "'Was it really as late as that?' "'Veronica sounded quite amazed. "'Yes, it was, Miss Cray. "'Of course, we had so much to talk over, "'not having seen each other for so many years. "'Are you sure it was quite so long "'since you had seen Dr. Christo? "'I've just told you. I hadn't seen him for fifteen years. Are you quite sure you're not making a mistake? I've got the impression you might have been seeing quite a lot of him. What on earth makes you think that? Well, uh, this note, for one thing. Inspector Grange took out a letter from his pocket, glanced down at it, cleared his throat, and read, Please come over this morning. I must see you, Veronica. Yes, she smiled. It is a little peremptory, perhaps. I'm afraid Hollywood makes one, well, <laughs> rather arrogant. Dr. Christo came over to your house the following morning in answer to that summons. You had a quarrel. Would you care to tell me, Miss Cray, what that quarrel was about? The inspector had unmasked his batteries. He was quick to seize the flash of anger, the ill-tempered tightening of the lips. She snapped out, We didn't quarrel. Oh, yes, you did, Miss Cray. Your last words were, I think I hate you more than I believed I could hate anyone. She was silent now. He could feel her thinking, thinking quickly and warily. Some women might have rushed into speech, but Veronica Cray was too clever for that. She shrugged her shoulders and said lightly, I see. More servants' tales. My little maid has a rather lively imagination. There are different ways of saying things, you know. I can assure you, that I wasn't being melodramatic. It was really a mildly flirtatious remark. We had been sparring together. The words were not intended to be taken seriously? Certainly not. And I can assure you, Inspector, that it was fifteen years since I had last seen John Christo. You can verify that for yourself. She was poised again, detached, sure of herself. Grange did not argue or pursue the subject. He got up. "'That's all for the moment, Miss Cray,' he said pleasantly. He went out of Dovecots and down the lane, and turned in at the gate of Resthaven. Hercule Poirot stared at the inspector in the utmost surprise. He repeated incredulously, "'The revolver that Gerda Christa was holding, and which was subsequently dropped into the pool, was not the revolver that fired the fatal shot? But that is extraordinary!' "'Exactly, Monsieur Poirot. Put bluntly, it just doesn't make sense.' Poirot murmured softly, "'No, it does not make sense. But all the same, Inspector, it has got to make sense, sir.' Huh? The Inspector sighed heavily. "'That's just it, Monsieur Poirot. 
We've got to find some way that it does make sense. But at the moment, I can't see it. The truth is that we shan't get much further until we've found the gun that was used. It came from Sir Henry's collection, all right. At least, there's one missing. And that means that the whole thing is still tied up with the hollow. Yes, murmured Poirot, it is still tied up with the hollow. It seemed a simple, straightforward business, went on the inspector. Well, it isn't so simple, or so straightforward. No, said Poirot, it is not simple. We've got to admit the possibility that the thing was a frame-up. That's to say, it was all set to implicate Gerda Christo. But if that was so, why not leave the right revolver lying by the body for her to pick up? She might not have picked it up. Well, that's true. But even if she didn't, so long as nobody else's fingerprints were on the gun, that's to say, if it was wiped after use, she would probably have been suspected all right. And that's what the murderer wanted, wasn't it? Was it? Grange stared. Well, if you'd done a murder, you'd want to plant it good and quick on someone else, wouldn't you? That would be a murderer's normal reaction. Yes, said Poirot, but then perhaps we have here a rather unusual type of murderer. It is possible that that is the solution of our problem. What is the solution? Poirot said thoughtfully. An unusual type of murderer. Inspector Grange stared at him curiously. He said, But then, what was the murderer's idea? What was he or she getting at? Poirot spread out his hands with a sigh. I have no idea. I have no idea at all. But it seems to me, dimly... Yes? That the murderer is someone who wanted to kill John Christo, but who did not want to implicate Gerda Christo. <laughs> Actually, we suspected her right away. Ah, yes, but it was only a matter of time before the facts about the gun came to light, and that was bound to give a new angle. In the interval, the murderer has had time. Poirot came to a full stop. Time to do what? Ah, mon ami, there you have me. Again, I have to say, I do not know. Inspector Grange took a turn or two up and down the room. Then he stopped and came to a stand in front of Poirot. I've come to you this afternoon, Monsieur Poirot, for two reasons. One is because I know, it's pretty well known in the force, that you're a man of wide experience who's done some very tricky work on this type of problem. That's reason number one. But there's another reason. You were there. You were an eyewitness. You saw what happened. Poirot nodded. Yes, I saw what happened, but the eyes, Inspector Grange, are very unreliable witnesses. What do you mean, Monsieur Poirot? The eyes see sometimes what they are meant to see. Or well, you think that it was planned out beforehand? I suspected. It was exactly, you understand, like a stage scene. What I saw was clear enough. A man who had just been shot, and the woman who had shot him holding in her hand the gun she had just used. That is what I saw. And already we know that in one particular the picture is wrong. That gun had not been used to shoot John Christo. Hmm. The inspector pulled his drooping moustache firmly downwards. What you are getting at is that some of the other particulars of the picture may be wrong too. Poirot nodded. He said, There were three other people present, three people who had apparently just arrived on the scene. But that may not be true either. The pool is surrounded by a thick grove of young chestnuts. From the pool five paths lead away. One to the house, one up to the woods, one up to the flower walk, one down from the pool to the farm, and one to the lane here. Of those three people, each one came along a different path. Edward Angatel, from the woods above, Lady Angatel, up from the farm, and Henrietta Savenick, from the flower border above the house. Those three arrived upon the scene of the crime almost simultaneously, and a few minutes after Gerda Christo. But one of those three, Inspector, could have been at the pool before Gerda Christo arrived, could have shot John Christo, and could have retreated up or down one of the paths, and then, turning round, could have arrived at the same time as the others. Inspector Grange said, Yes, it's possible. And another possibility, not envisaged at the time, someone could have come along the path from the lane, could have shot John Christo, and could have gone back the same way 
unseen. Grange said, You're dead right. There are two other possible suspects beside Gerda Christo. We've got the same motive. Jealousy. It's definitely a cream passionelle. There were two other women mixed up with John Christo. He paused and said, Christo went over to see Veronica Cray that morning. They had a row. She told him that she'd make him sorry for what he'd done, and she said she hated him more than she believed she could hate anyone. Interesting, murmured Poirot. She's straight from Hollywood, and by what I read in the papers they do a bit of shooting each other out there sometimes. She could have come along to get her furs, which she left in the pavilion the night before. They could have met, the whole thing could have flared up, she fired at him, and then, hearing someone coming, she could have dodged back the way she came. He paused a moment and then added irritably, And now we come to the part where it all goes haywire. That damn gun. Unless, his eyes brightened, she shot him with her own gun and dropped one that she'd pinched from Sir Henry's study so as to throw suspicion on the crowd at the hollow. She might know about our being able to identify the gun used from the marks on the rifling. How many people do know that, I wonder? I put the point to Sir Henry. He said he thought quite a lot of people would know on account of all the detective stories that are written. Quoted a new one, The Clue of the Dripping Fountain, which he said John Christo himself had been reading on Saturday and which emphasised that particular point. But Veronica Cray would have had to have got the gun somehow from Sir Henry's study. Yes, it would mean premeditation. The inspector took another tug at his moustache. Then he looked at Poirot. But you've hinted yourself at another possibility, Monsieur Poirot. There's Miss Savernake. And here's where your eyewitness stuff, or rather, I should say, ear-witness stuff, comes in again. Dr. Christo said, Henrietta, when he was dying. You heard him. They all heard him. Though Mr. Angertel doesn't seem to have caught what he said. Edward Angertel did not hear. That is interesting. But the others did. Miss Savernake herself says he tried to speak to her. Lady Angertel says he opened his eyes, saw Miss Savernake, and said, Henrietta. She doesn't, I think, attach any importance to it. Poirot smiled. No, she would not attach much importance to it. Now, Monsieur Poirot, what about you? You were there. You saw. You heard. Was Dr. Christo trying to tell you all that it was Henrietta who had shot him? In short, was that word an accusation? Poirot said slowly, I did not think so at the time. But now, Monsieur Poirot, what do you think now? Poirot sighed. Then he said slowly, It may have been so. I cannot say more than that. It is an impression only for which you are asking me. And when the moment is past, there is a temptation to read into things a meaning which was not there at the time. Grange said hastily, well, Of course, this is all off the record. What Monsieur Poirot thought isn't evidence, I know that. It's only a pointer I'm trying to get. Oh, I understand you very well, and an impression from an eyewitness can be a very useful thing. But I am humiliated to have to say that my impressions are valueless. I was under the misconception, induced by the visual evidence, that Mrs. Christo had just shot her husband, so that when Dr. Christo opened his eyes and said, Henrietta, I never thought of it as being an accusation. It is tempting now, looking back, to read into that scene something that was not there. I know what you mean, said Grange, but it seems to me that since Henrietta was the last word Christo spoke, it must have meant one of two things— it was either an accusation of murder, or else it was, well, purely emotional. She's the woman he's in love with, and he's dying. Now, bearing everything in mind, which of the two did it sound like to you? Poirot sighed, stirred, closed his eyes, he opened them again, stretched out his hands in acute vexation. He said, His voice was urgent. That is all I can say. Urgent. It seemed to me neither accusing nor emotional, but urgent, yes, and of one thing I am sure. He was in full possession of his faculties. He spoke, yes, he spoke like a doctor, a doctor who has, say, a sudden surgical emergency on his hands, a patient who is bleeding to death, perhaps. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. That is the best I can do for you. Medical, eh? said the inspector. Well, yes, that is a third way of looking at it. He was shot— he suspected he was dying, he wanted something done for him quickly, 
and if, as Lady Angertel says, Miss Severnake was the first person he saw when his eyes opened, then he would appeal to her. It's not very satisfactory, though. Nothing about this case is satisfactory, said Poirot with some bitterness. A murder scene, set and staged to deceive Hercule Poirot, and which had deceived him. No, it was not satisfactory. Inspector Grange was looking out of the window. Hello, he said. Here's Clark, my sergeant. Looks as though he's got something. He's been working on the servants. A friendly touch. He's a nice-looking chap. Got away with women. Sergeant Clark came in a little breathlessly. He was clearly pleased with himself, though subduing the fact under a respectful official manner. Thought I'd better come and report, sir, since I knew where you'd gone. He hesitated, shooting a doubtful glance at Poirot whose exotic foreign appearance did not commend itself to his sense of official reticence. "'Out with it, my lad,' said Grange. "'Never mind Monsieur Poirot here. He's forgotten more about this game than you'll know for many years to come.' "'Yes, sir. It's this way, sir. I got something out of the kitchen maid,' Grange interrupted. He turned to Poirot triumphantly. "'What did I tell you? There's always hope where there's a kitchen maid.' Heaven help us when domestic staffs are so reduced that nobody keeps a kitchen maid any more. Kitchen maids talk. Kitchen maids babble. They're so kept down and in their place by the cook and the upper servants that it's only human nature to talk about what they know to someone who wants to hear it. Go on, Clark. This is what the girl says, sir, that on Sunday afternoon she saw Gudgeon, the butler, walking across the hall with a revolver in his hand. Gudgeon? Yes, sir. Clark referred to a notebook. These are her own words. I don't know what to do, but I think I ought to say what I saw that day. I saw Mr. Gudgeon. He was standing in the hall with a revolver in his hand. Mr. Gudgeon looked very peculiar indeed. I don't suppose, said Clark, breaking off, that the part about looking peculiar means anything. She probably put that in out of her head, but I thought you ought to know about it at once, sir. Inspector Grange rose with the satisfaction of a man who sees a task ahead of him, which he is well fitted to perform. Gudgeon, he said, I'll have a word with Mr. Gudgeon right away. Sitting once more in Sir Henry's study, Inspector Grange stared at the impassive face of the man in front of him. So far, the honours lay with Gudgeon. I am very sorry, sir, he repeated. I suppose I ought to have mentioned the occurrence— but it had slipped my memory. He looked apologetically from the inspector to Sir Henry. It was about five-thirty, if I remember rightly, sir. I was crossing the hall to see if there were any letters for the post when I noticed a revolver lying on the hall table. I presumed it was from the master's collection, so I picked it up and brought it in here. There was a gap on the shelf by the mantelpiece where it had come from, so I replaced it where it belonged. Point it out to me, said Grange. Gudgeon rose and went to the shelf in question, the inspector close behind him. It was this one, sir. Gudgeon's finger indicated a small Mauser pistol at the end of the row. It was a point two five, Quite a small weapon. It was certainly not the gun that had killed John Christo. Grange, with his eyes on Gudgeon's face, said, That's an automatic pistol, not a revolver. Gudgeon coughed. <laughs> Indeed, sir. I am afraid that I am not at all well up in firearms— I may have used the term revolver rather loosely, sir. But you're quite sure that that is the gun you found in the hall and brought in here? Oh, yes, sir. There can be no possible doubt about that. Grange stopped him as he was about to stretch out a hand. Don't touch it, please. I must examine it for fingerprints and to see if it's loaded. I don't think it is loaded, sir. None of Sir Henry's collection is kept loaded. And as for fingerprints... I polished it over with my handkerchief before replacing it, sir, so there will only be my fingerprints on it. Why did you do that? asked Grange sharply. But Gudgeon's apologetic smile did not waver. I fancied it might be dusty, sir. The door opened, and Lady Angertel came in. She smiled at the inspector. How nice to see you, Inspector Grange. What is all this about a revolver and Gudgeon? That child in the kitchen is in floods of tears. Mrs. Medway has been bullying her, but of course the girl was quite right to say what she saw if she thought she ought to do so. I always find right and wrong so bewildering myself. Easy, you know, if right is unpleasant and wrong is agreeable, because then one knows where one is, but confusing when it is the other way about. And I think, don't you, Inspector, that everyone must do what they think right themselves. What have you been telling them about that pistol, Gudgeon? Gudgeon said, with respectful emphasis, 
The pistol was in the hall, my lady, on the centre table. I have no idea where it came from. I brought it in here and put it away in its proper place. That is what I have just told the inspector, and he quite understands. Lady Angertel shook her head. She said gently, You really shouldn't have said that, Gudgeon. I'll talk to the inspector myself. Gudgeon made a slight movement, and Lady Angertel said very charmingly, I do appreciate your motives, Gudgeon. I know how you always try to save us trouble and annoyance. She added in gentle dismissal, That will be all now. Gudgeon hesitated, threw a fleeting glance towards Sir Henry, and then at the inspector, then bowed and moved towards the door. Grange made a motion as though to stop him, but for some reason he was not able to define to himself. He let his arm fall again. Gudgeon went out and closed the door. Lady Angertel dropped into a chair and smiled at the two men. She said conversationally, "'You know, I really do think that was very charming of Gudgeon. Quite feudal, if you know what I mean. Yes, feudal is the right word.' Grange said stiffly, "'Am I to understand, Lady Angertel, that you yourself have some further knowledge about the matter?' "'Well, of course. Gudgeon didn't find it in the hall at all. He found it when he took the eggs out.' "'The eggs?' Inspector Grange stared at her. "'Out of the basket,' said Lady Angertel. She seemed to think that everything was now quite clear. Sir Henry said gently, "'You must tell us a little more, my dear. Inspector Grange and I are still at sea.' "'Oh!' Lady Angertel set herself to be explicit. The pistol, you see, was in the basket, under the eggs. What basket? And what eggs, Lady Angertel? The basket I took down to the farm. The pistol was in it. Then I put the eggs on top of the pistol and forgot all about it. And when we found poor John Christo dead by the pool, it was such a shock, I let go of the basket, and Gudgeon just caught it in time. Because of the eggs, I mean. If I dropped it, they would have been broken. And he brought it back to the house, and later I asked him about writing the date on the eggs, a thing I always do. Otherwise, one eats the fresher eggs, sometimes before the older ones, and he said that all that had been attended to, and now that I remember, he was rather emphatic about it, and that is what I mean by being feudal. He found the pistol and put it back in here, I suppose really because there were police in the house. Servants are always so worried by police, I find, very nice and loyal, but also quite stupid, because, of course, Inspector, it's the truth you want to hear, isn't it? And Lady Angertel finished up by giving the Inspector a beaming smile. <clears throat> the truth is what I mean to get at said Grange, rather grimly. Lady Angertel sighed. "'It all seems such a fuss, doesn't it?' she said. "'I mean, all this hounding people down. I don't suppose whoever it was who shot John Christo really meant to shoot him. Not seriously, I mean. If it was Gerda, I'm sure she didn't. In fact, I'm really surprised that she didn't miss. It's the sort of thing that one would expect of Gerda, and she's really a very nice, kind creature. And if you go and put her in prison and hang her, what on earth is going to happen to the children? If she did shoot John—' She's probably dreadfully sorry about it now. It's bad enough for children to have a father who's been murdered. But it will make it infinitely worse for them to have their mother hanged for it. Sometimes I don't think you policemen think of these things. We are not contemplating arresting anyone at present, Lady Angertel. Well, that's sensible at any rate. But I have thought all along, Inspector Grange, that you were a very sensible sort of man. Again, that charming, almost dazzling smile. Inspector Grange blinked a little. He could not help it but he came firmly to the point at issue. <clears throat> As you said just now, Lady Angertel, it's the truth I want to get at. You took the pistol from here. Uh, which gun was it, by the way? Lady Angertel nodded her head towards the shelf by the mantelpiece. The second from the end, the Mauser 25. Something in the crisp, technical way she spoke jarred on Grange. He had not somehow expected Lady Angertel whom up to now he had labelled in his own mind as vague and just a bit batty, to describe a firearm with such technical precision. You took the pistol from here and put it in your basket. Why? I knew you'd ask me that, said Lady Angertel. Her tone, unexpectedly, was almost triumphant. And, of course, there must be some reason. Don't you think so, Henry? She turned to her husband. Don't you think I must have had a reason for taking a pistol out that morning? I should certainly have thought so, my dear, said Sir Henry, stiffly. One does things, said Lady Angertel, gazing thoughtfully in front of her, and then one doesn't remember why one has done them. But I think you know, Inspector, that there always is a reason, if one can only get at it. I must have had some idea in my head when I put the Mauser into my egg-basket. She appealed to him. What do you think it can have been? Grange stared at her. She displayed no embarrassment, just a childlike eagerness. It beat him. He had never yet met anyone like Lucy Angertel, and just for the moment— he didn't know what to do about it. "'My wife,' said Sir Henry, "'is extremely absent-minded, Inspector.' 
So it seems, sir, said Grange. He did not say it very nicely. Why do you think I took that pistol? Lady Angertel asked him confidentially. I have no idea, Lady Angertel. I came in here, mused Lady Angertel. I'd been talking to... Simmons about the pillowcases, and I remember dimly crossing over to the fireplace and thinking we must get a new poker. The curate, not the rector, Inspector Grange stared. He felt his head going round. And I remember picking up the Mauser. It was a nice handy little gun. I've always liked it, and dropping it into the basket. I just got the basket from the flower room, but there were so many things in my head. Simmons, you know, and the bindweed in the Michaelmas daisies, and hoping Mrs. Medway would make a really rich sherry trifle. Inspector Grange spoke fiercely and brusquely, feeling like a man who brushes away fine spider's webs which are impairing his vision. Did you load the pistol? He had hoped to startle her, perhaps even to frighten her a little, but Lady Angertel only considered the question with a kind of desperate thoughtfulness. Now did I? That's so stupid, I can't remember. But I should think I must have. Don't you, Inspector? I mean, what's the good of a pistol without ammunition? I wish I could remember exactly what was in my head at the time. "'My dear Lucy,' said Sir Henry, "'what goes on or does not go on in your head "'has been the despair of every one who knows you well for years.' "'She flashed him a very sweet smile. "'I am trying to remember, Henry, dear. "'One does such curious things. "'I picked up the telephone receiver the other morning, "'and I found myself looking down at it quite bewildered. "'I couldn't imagine what I wanted with it.' "'Presumably you were going to ring someone up,' "'said the inspector coldly. "'No, funnily enough, I wasn't. 
I remembered afterwards. I'd been wondering why Mrs. Mears, the gardener's wife, held her baby in such an odd way, and I picked up the telephone receiver to try, you know, just how one would hold a baby. And, of course, I realised that it had looked odd, because Mrs. Mears was left-handed, and had its head the other way round. She looked triumphantly from one to the other of the two men. Well, thought the inspector, I suppose it's possible that there are people like this. But he did not feel very sure about it. The whole thing, he realised, might be a tissue of lies. The kitchen-maid, for instance, had distinctly stated that it was a revolver Gudgeon had been holding. Still, you couldn't set much store by that. The girl knew nothing of firearms. She had heard a revolver talked about in connection with the crime, and revolver or pistol would be all one to her. Both Gudgeon and Lady Angertel had specified the Mauser pistol, but there was nothing to prove their statement. It might actually have been the missing revolver that Gudgeon had been handling, and he might have returned it not to the study, but to Lady Angertel herself. The servants all seemed absolutely besotted about the damned woman. Supposing it was actually she who had shot John Christo? But why should she? He couldn't see why. Would they still back her up and tell lies for her? He had an uncomfortable feeling that that was just what they would do. And now this fantastic story of hers about not being able to remember. Surely she could think up something better than that. And looking so natural about it, not in the least embarrassed or apprehensive. Damn it all! She gave you the impression that she was speaking the literal truth. He got up. When you remember a little more, perhaps you'll tell me, Lady Angertel, he said dryly. She answered, Of course I will, Inspector. Things come to one quite suddenly sometimes. Grange went out of the study. In the hall he put a finger round the inside of a collar and drew a deep breath. He felt all tangled up in thistledown. What he needed was his oldest and foulest pipe, a pint of ale and a good steak and chips, something plain and objective. In the study Lady Angertel flitted about touching things here and there with a vague forefinger. Sir Henry sat back in his chair watching her. He said at last, "'Why did you take the pistol, Lucy?' Lady Angertel came back and sank down gracefully into a chair. "'I'm not really quite sure, Henry. I suppose I had some vague ideas of an accident.' "'Accident? Yes, all those roots of trees, you know,' said Lady Angertel vaguely. "'Sticking out. So easy just to trip over one. One might have had a few shots at the target and left one shot in the magazine. Careless, of course, but then people are careless. I've always thought, you know, that accident—' would be the simplest way to do a thing of that kind. One would be dreadfully sorry, of course, and blame oneself. Her voice died away. Her husband sat very still without taking his eyes off her face. He spoke again in the same quiet, careful voice. Who was to have had the accident? Lucy turned her head a little, looking at him in surprise. John Christo, of course. Good God, Lucy! He broke off. She said earnestly, Oh, Henry, I've been so dreadfully worried. About Ainswick. I see. It's Ainswick. You've always cared too much about Ainswick, Lucy. Sometimes I think it's the only thing you do care for. Edward and David are the last, the last of the Angertels. And David won't do, Henry. He'll never marry, because of his mother and all that. He'll get the place when Edward dies, and he won't marry. And you and I will be dead long before he's even middle-aged. He'll be the last of the Angertels and the whole thing will die out. Does it matter so much, Lucy? Of course it matters. Ainswick! <laughs> you should have been a boy, Lucy. But he smiled a little, for he could not imagine Lucy being anything but feminine. It all depends on Edward's marrying, and Edward's so obstinate. That long head of his, like my father's. I hoped he'd get over Henrietta and marry some nice girl, but I see now that that's hopeless. Then I thought that Henrietta's affair with John would run the usual course. John's affairs were never, I imagine, very permanent. But I saw him looking at her the other evening. He really cared about her. If only John were out of the way, I felt that Henrietta would marry Edward. She's not the kind of person to cherish a memory and live in the past. So, you see, it all came to that. Get rid of John Christo. Lucy. You didn't. <laughs> what did you do, Lucy? Lady Angertel got up again. She took two dead flowers out of a vase. Darling, she said, you don't imagine for a moment, do you, that I shot John Christo? I did have that silly idea about an accident. But then, you know, 
I remembered that we asked John Christo here. It's not as though he proposed himself. One can't ask someone to be your guest, and then arrange accidents. Even Arabs are most particular about hospitality, so don't worry. Will you, Henry? She stood looking at him with a brilliant, affectionate smile. He said heavily, I always worry about you, Lucy. There's no need, darling. And you see, everything has actually turned out all right. John has been got rid of without our doing anything about it. It reminds me, said Lady Angertel reminiscently, of that man in Bombay, who was so frightfully rude to me. He was run over by a tram three days later. She unbolted the French windows and went out into the garden. Sir Henry sat still, watching her tall, slender figure wander down the path. He looked old and tired, and his face was the face of a man who lives at close quarters with fear. In the kitchen, a tearful Doris Emmet was wilting under the stern reproof of Mr. Gudgeon. Mrs. Medway and Miss Simmons acted as a kind of Greek chorus. "'Putting yourself forward and jumping to conclusions in a way only an inexperienced girl would do.' "'That's right,' said Mrs. Medway. "'If you see me with a pistol in my hand, the proper thing to do is to come to me and say, "'Mr. Gudgeon, will you be so kind as to give me an explanation?' "'Or you could have come to me,' put in Mrs. Medway. "'I'm always willing to tell a young girl what doesn't know the world what she ought to think.' "'What you should not have done,' said Gudgeon severely, "'is to go babbling off to a policeman, and only a sergeant at that. "'Never get mixed up with the police more than you can help. "'It's painful enough having them in the house at all.' "'Inexpressibly painful,' murmured Miss Simmons. "'Such a thing never happened to me before. "'We all know,' went on Gudgeon, "'what her ladyship is like. "'Nothing her ladyship does would ever surprise me, "'but the police don't know her ladyship the way we do.' and it's not to be thought of that her ladyship should be worried with silly questions and suspicions just because she wanders about with firearms. It's the sort of thing she would do. But the police have the kind of mind that just sees murder and nasty things like that. Her ladyship is the kind of absent-minded lady who wouldn't hurt a fly, but there's no denying that she puts things in funny places. I shall never forget, added Gudgeon with feeling, when she brought back a live lobster and put it on the card tray in the hall. Thought I was seeing things. "'That must have been before my time,' said Simmons, with curiosity. Mrs. Medway checked these revelations with a glance at the erring Doris. "'Some other time,' she said. "'Now then, Doris, we've only been speaking to you for your own good. It's common to be mixed up with the police, and don't you forget it. You can get on with the vegetables now, and be more careful with the run of beans than you were last night.' Doris sniffed. "'Yes, Mrs. Medway,' she said, and shuffled over to the sink. Mrs. Medway said forebodingly, I don't feel as I'm going to have a light Anne with my pastry. That nasty inquest tomorrow gives me a turn every time I think of it. A thing like that. Happening to us. The latch of the gate clicked, and Poirot looked out of the window in time to see the visitor who was coming up the path to the front door. He knew at once who she was. He wondered very much what brought Veronica Cray to see him. She brought a delicious faint scent into the room with her, a scent that Poirot recognised. She wore tweeds and brogues, as Henrietta had done, but she was, he decided, very different from Henrietta. "'Monsieur Poirot!' Her tone was delightful, a little thrilled. "'I've only just discovered who my neighbour is, and I've always wanted to know you so much!' He took her outstretched hands, bowed over them. "'Enchanted, madame!' She accepted the homage smilingly refused his offer of tea, coffee, or cocktail. "'No, I've just come to talk to you, to talk seriously. I'm worried.' "'You are worried. I am sorry to hear that.' Veronica sat down and sighed. "'It's about John Christo's death. The inquest's tomorrow. You know that?' "'Yes, yes, I know. And the whole thing has been really so extraordinary,' she broke off. "'Most people really wouldn't believe it. But you would, I think, because you know something about human nature.' "'I know a little about human nature,' admitted Poirot. "'Inspector Grange came to see me. "'He'd got it into his head that I'd quarrelled with John, "'which is true in a way, though not in the way he meant. "'I told him that I hadn't seen John for fifteen years, "'and he simply didn't believe me. "'But it's true, Monsieur Poirot.' "'Poirot said, "'Since it is true, it can easily be proved. "'So why worry?' "'She returned his smile in the friendliest fashion. "'The real truth is that I simply haven't dared to tell the inspector— what actually happened on Saturday evening. It's so absolutely fantastic that he certainly wouldn't believe it. But I felt I must tell someone. That's why I've come to you. Poirot said quietly, I am flattered. 
That fact, he noted, she took for granted. She was a woman, he thought, who was very sure of the effect she was producing, so sure that she might occasionally make a mistake. John and I were engaged to be married fifteen years ago. He was very much in love with me, so much so that it rather alarmed me sometimes. He wanted me to give up acting, to give up having any mind or life of my own. He was so possessive and masterful that I felt I couldn't go through with it, and I broke off the engagement. I am afraid he took that very hard. Poirot clicked a discreet and sympathetic tongue. I didn't see him again until last Saturday night. He walked home with me. I told the inspector that we talked about old times. Well, that's true in a way, but there was far more than that. Yes? John went mad. Quite mad. He wanted to leave his wife and children. He wanted me to get a divorce from my husband and marry him. He said he'd never forgotten me, that the moment he saw me, time stood still. She closed her eyes. She swallowed. Under her makeup, her face was very pale. She opened her eyes again and smiled almost timidly at Poirot. "'Can you believe that a, a feeling like that is possible?' she asked. "'I think it is possible, yes,' said Poirot. "'Never to forget, to go on waiting, planning, hoping, to determine with all one's heart and mind to get what one wants in the end. There are men like that, Monsieur Poirot.' "'Yes, and women.' She gave him a hard stare. "'I'm talking about men, about John Christo. Well, that's how it was. I protested at first, laughed, refused to take him seriously. Then I told him he was mad. It was quite late when he went back to the house. We'd argued and argued. He was still just as determined.' She swallowed again. "'That's why I sent him a note the next morning. I couldn't leave things like that. I had to make him realise that what he wanted was impossible.' It was impossible? Of course it was impossible. He came over. He wouldn't listen to what I had to say. He was just as insistent. I told him that it was no good, that I didn't love him, that I hated him. She paused, breathing hard. I had to be brutal about it. So we parted in anger. And now? He's dead. He saw her hands creep together, saw the twisted fingers and the knuckles stand out. They were large, rather cruel hands. The strong emotion that she was feeling communicated itself to him. It was not sorrow, not grief. No, it was anger. The anger, he thought, of a baffled egoist. Well, Monsieur Poirot? Her voice was controlled and smooth again. What am I to do? Tell the story? Or keep it to myself? It's what happened. But it takes a bit of believing. Poirot looked at her a long, considering gaze. He did not think that Veronica Cray was telling the truth. And yet there was an undeniable undercurrent of sincerity. It happened, he thought, but it did not happen like that. And suddenly he got it. It was a true story, inverted. It was she who had been unable to forget John Christo. It was she who had been baffled and repulsed. And now— unable to bear in silence the furious anger of a tigress deprived of what she considered her legitimate prey, she had invented a version of the truth that should satisfy her wounded pride and feed a little the aching hunger for a man who had gone beyond the reach of her clutching hands. Impossible to admit that she, Veronica Cray, could not have what she wanted. So she had changed it all around. Poirot took a deep breath and spoke, if all this had any bearing on John Christo's death, you would have to speak out, but if it has not, and I cannot see why it should have, then I think you are quite justified in keeping it to yourself. He wondered if she was disappointed. He had a fancy that in her present mood she would like to hurl her story into the printed page of a newspaper. She had come to him. Why? To try out her story? To test his reactions? Or to use him? to induce him to pass the story on. If his mild response disappointed her, she did not show it. She got up and gave him one of those long, well-manicured hands. Thank you, Monsieur Poirot. What you say seems eminently sensible. I'm so glad I came to you. I, I felt I wanted somebody to know. I shall respect your confidence, madame. When she had gone, he opened the windows a little, 
scents affected him. He did not like Veronica's scent. It was expensive, but cloying, overpowering, like her personality. He wondered, as he flapped the curtains, whether Veronica Cray had killed John Christo. She would have been willing to kill him. He believed that. She would have enjoyed pressing the trigger, would have enjoyed seeing him stagger and fall. But behind that vindictive anger was something cold and shrewd, something that appraised chances, a cool, calculating intelligence. However much Veronica Cray wished to kill John Christo, he doubted whether she would have taken the risk. The inquest was over. It had been the merest formality of an affair, and though warned of this beforehand, nearly everyone had a resentful sense of anticlimax. Adjourned for a fortnight at the request of the police. Gerda had driven down with Mrs. Patterson from London in a hired Daimler. She had on a black dress and an unbecoming hat, and looked nervous and bewildered. Preparatory to stepping back into the Daimler, she paused as Lady Angertel came up to her. "'How are you, Gerda, dear? Not sleeping too badly, I hope?' I think it went off as well as we could hope for, don't you? So sorry we haven't got you with us at the hollow, but I quite understand how distressing that would be. Mrs. Patterson said in her bright voice, glancing reproachfully at her sister for not introducing her properly, This was Miss Collins' idea, to drive straight down and back. Expensive, of course, but we thought it was worth it. Oh, I do so agree with you. Mrs. Patterson lowered her voice. I am taking Gerda and the children straight down to Beck's Hill. What she needs is rest and quiet. The reporters, you've no idea, simply swarming round Harley Street. A young man snapped off a camera, and Elsie Patterson pushed her sister into the car, and they drove off. The others had a momentary view of Gerda's face beneath the unbecoming hat-brim. It was vacant, lost. She looked for the moment like a half-witted child. Midge Hardcastle muttered under her breath, Poor devil, Edward said irritably. What did everybody see in Christo? That wretched woman looks completely heartbroken. She was absolutely wrapped up in him, said Midge. But why? He was a selfish sort of fellow. Good company in a way, but— He broke off. Then he asked, What did you think of him, Midge? I? Midge reflected. She said at last, rather surprised at her own words, I think I respected him. Respected him? For what? Well— he knew his job. Oh, you're thinking of him as a doctor? Yes. There was no time for more. Henrietta was driving Midge back to London in her car. Edward was returning to lunch at the hollow and going up by the afternoon train with David. He said vaguely to Midge, You must come out and lunch one day. And Midge said that that would be very nice, but that she couldn't take more than an hour off. Edward gave her his charming smile and said, Oh, it's a special occasion. I'm sure they'll understand. Then he moved towards Henrietta. I'll ring you up, Henrietta. Yes, do, Edward. But I may be out a good deal. Out? She gave him a quick, mocking smile. Drowning my sorrow. You don't expect me to sit at home and mope, do you? He said slowly. I don't understand you nowadays, Henrietta. You're quite different. Her face softened. She said unexpectedly, darling Edward, and gave his arm a quick squeeze. Then she turned to Lucy Angertel. I can come back if I want to, can't I, Lucy? Lady Angertel said, Of course, darling. And anyway, there will be the inquest again in a fortnight. Henrietta went to where she had parked the car in the market square. Her suitcases and midges were already inside. They got in and drove off. The car climbed the long hill and came out on the road over the ridge, Below them the brown and golden leaves shivered a little in the chill of a grey autumn day. Midge said suddenly, "'I'm glad to get away, even from Lucy, darling as she is. She gives me the creeps sometimes.' Henrietta was looking intently into the small driving mirror. She said rather inattentively, "'Lucy has to give the cholera a touch even to murder. You know, I've never thought about murder before. Why should you?' It isn't a thing one thinks about. It's a six-letter word in a crossword, or a pleasant entertainment between the covers of a book. But the real thing— She paused. Midge finished. Is real. That is what startles one. Henrietta said, 
It needn't be startling to you. You are outside it. Perhaps the only one of us who is, Midge said. We're all outside it now. We've got away, Henrietta murmured. Have we? She was looking in the driving mirror again. Suddenly she put her foot down on the accelerator. The car responded. She glanced at the speedometer. They were doing over fifty. Presently the needle reached sixty. Midge looked sideways at Henrietta's profile. It was not like Henrietta to drive recklessly. She liked speed, but the winding road hardly justified the pace they were going. There was a grim smile hovering round Henrietta's mouth. She said, Look over your shoulder, Midge. See that car way back there? Yes. It's a Ventnor Ten. Is it? Midge was not particularly interested. They're useful little cars, low petrol consumption, keep the road well, but they're not fast. No? Curious, thought Midge, how fascinated Henrietta always was by cars and their performance. As I say, they're not fast, but that car, Midge, has managed to keep its distance, although we've been going over sixty. Midge turned a startled face to her. Do you mean that— Henrietta nodded. The police, I believe, have special engines in very ordinary-looking cars. Midge said, You mean they're still keeping an eye on us all? It seems rather obvious. Midge shivered. Henrietta, can you understand the meaning of this second gun business? No. It lets Gerda out, but beyond that it just doesn't seem to add up to anything. But if it was one of Henry's guns— We don't know that it was. It hasn't been found yet, remember? No, that's true. It could be someone outside altogether. Do you know who I'd like to think killed John, Henrietta? That woman. Veronica Cray? Yes. Henrietta said nothing. She drove on with her eyes fixed sternly on the road ahead of her. Don't you think it's possible? persisted Midge. Possible, yes, said Henrietta slowly. Then you don't think— It's no good thinking a thing because you want to think it. It's the perfect solution, letting all of us out. Us? But we're in it, all of us, even you, Midge, darling, though they'd be hard put to it to find a motive for your shooting John. Of course, I'd like it to be Veronica. Nothing would please me better than to see her giving a lovely performance, as Lucy would put it, in the dock. Midge shot a quick look at her. Tell me, Henrietta, does it all make you feel vindictive? You mean, Henrietta paused for a moment, because I love John. Yes. As she spoke, Midge realized with a slight sense of shock that this was the first time the bald fact had been put into words. It had been accepted by them all, by Lucy and Henry, by Midge, by Edward even, that Henrietta loved John Christo, but nobody had ever so much as hinted at the fact in words before. There was a pause whilst Henrietta seemed to be thinking— Then she said in a thoughtful voice, I can't explain to you what I feel. Perhaps I don't know myself. They were driving now over Albert Bridge. Henrietta said, You'd better come to the studio, Midge. We'll have tea, and I'll drive you to your digs afterwards. Here in London, the short afternoon light was already fading. They drew up at the studio door, and Henrietta put her key into the door. She went in and switched on the light. It's chilly, she said. We better light the gas fire. Oh, bother. I meant to get some matches on the way. Won't a lighter do? Mine's no good, and anyway it's difficult to light a gas fire with one. Make yourself at home. There's an old blind man stands on the corner. I usually get my matches off him. I shan't be a minute or two. Left alone in the studio, Midge wandered round, looking at Henrietta's work. It gave her an eerie feeling to be sharing the empty studio with these creations of wood and bronze— There was a bronze head with high cheekbones, and a tin hat, possibly a Red Army soldier, and there was an airy structure of twisted, ribbon-like aluminium, which intrigued her a good deal. There was a vast, static frog in pinkish granite. And at the end of the studio she came to an almost life-sized wooden figure. She was staring at it when Henrietta's key turned in the door, and Henrietta herself came in slightly breathless. Midge turned— What's this, Henrietta? It's rather frightening. That? That's the worshipper. It's going to the international group. Midge repeated, staring at it. It's frightening. Kneeling to light the gas fire, Henrietta said over her shoulder, It's interesting you're saying that. Why do you find it frightening? I think 
because it hasn't any face. How right you are, Midge. It's very good, Henrietta. Henrietta said lightly, It's a nice bit of pear wood. She rose from her knees. She tossed her big satchel bag and her furs onto the divan and threw down a couple of boxes of matches on the table. Midge was struck by the expression on her face. It had a sudden, quite inexplicable exultation. Now for tea, said Henrietta, and in her voice was the same warm jubilation that Midge had already glimpsed in her face. It struck an almost jarring note, but Midge forgot it, in a train of thought aroused by the sight of the two boxes of matches. You remember those matches Veronica Cray took away with her? When Lucy insisted on foisting a whole half-dozen on her, yes. Did anyone ever find out whether she had matches in her cottage all the time? I expect the police did. They're very thorough. A faintly triumphant smile was curving Henrietta's lips. Midge felt puzzled and almost repelled. She thought, Can Henrietta really have cared for John? Can she? Surely not. And a faint, desolate chill struck through her as she reflected, Edward will not have to wait very long. Ungenerous of her not to let that thought bring warmth. She wanted Edward to be happy, didn't she? It wasn't as though she could have Edward herself. To Edward she would be always little Midge. Never more than that. Never a woman to be loved. Edward, unfortunately, was the faithful kind. Well, the faithful kind usually got what they wanted in the end. Edward and Henrietta at Ainswick. That was the proper ending to the story. Edward and Henrietta living happily ever afterwards. She could see it all very clearly. Cheer up, Midge, said Henrietta. You mustn't let murder get you down. Shall we go out later and have a spot of dinner together? But Midge said quickly that she must get back to her rooms. She had things to do, letters to write. In fact, she'd better go as soon as she'd finished her cup of tea. All right, I'll drive you there. I could get a taxi. Nonsense. Let's use the car, as it's there. They went out into the damp evening air. As they drove past the end of the mews, Henrietta pointed out a car drawn into the side. A Ventnor Ten. Ah, Shadow, you'll see, he'll follow us. How beastly it all is. Do you think so? I don't really mind. Henrietta dropped Midge at her rooms, and came back to the mews, and put her car away in the garage. Then she let herself into the studio once more. For some minutes she stood abstractedly, drumming with her fingers on the mantelpiece. Then she sighed, and murmured to herself, Well, to work. Better not waste time. She threw off her tweeds and got into her overall. An hour and a half later she drew back and studied what she had done. There were dabs of clay on her cheek, and her hair was dishevelled, but she nodded approval at the model on the stand. It was the rough similitude of a horse. The clay had been slapped on in great irregular lumps. It was the kind of horse that would have given the colonel of a cavalry regiment apoplexy, so unlike was it to any flesh-and-blood horse that had ever been foaled. It would have distressed Henrietta's Irish hunting forebears. Nevertheless, it was a horse, a horse conceived in the abstract. Henrietta wondered what Inspector Grange would think of it if he ever saw it, and her mouth widened a little in amusement as she pictured his face. Edward Angertel stood hesitantly in the swirl of foot traffic in Shaftesbury Avenue. He was nerving himself to enter the establishment which bore the gold-lettered sign Madame Alfrege. Some obscure instinct had prevented him from merely ringing up and asking Midge to come out to lunch. That fragment of telephone conversation at the hollow had disturbed him. More had shocked him. There had been in Midge's voice a submission, a subservience that had outraged all his feelings. For Midge, the free, the cheerful, the outspoken, to have to adopt that attitude, to have to submit, as she clearly was submitting, to rudeness and insolence, on the other end of the wire. It was all wrong. The whole thing was wrong. And then, when he had shown his concern, she had met him point-blank with the unpalatable truth that one had to keep one's job, that jobs weren't easy to get, and that the holding down of jobs entailed more unpleasantness than the mere performing of a stipulated task. Up till then, Edward had vaguely accepted the fact that a great many young women had jobs nowadays. If he had thought about it at all, 
he had thought that on the whole they had jobs because they liked jobs, that it flattered their sense of independence and gave them an interest of their own in life. The fact that a working day of nine to six, with an hour off for lunch, cut a girl off from most of the pleasures and relaxations of a leisured class had simply not occurred to Edward. That Midge, unless she sacrificed her lunch hour, could not drop into a picture gallery, that she could not go to an afternoon concert, drive out of town on a fine summer's day, lunch in a leisurely way at a distant restaurant, but had instead to relegate her excursions into the country to Saturday afternoons and Sundays, and to snatch her lunch in a crowded lion's or a snack bar, was a new and unwelcome discovery. He was very fond of Midge. Little Midge. That was how he thought of her. Arriving, shy and wide-eyed at Ainswick for the holidays, tongue-tied at first, then opening up into enthusiasm and affection. Edward's tendency to live exclusively in the past, and to accept the present dubiously as something yet untested, had delayed his recognition of Midge as a wage-earning adult. It was on that evening at the hollow, when he had come in cold and shivering from that strange, upsetting clash with Henrietta, and when Midge had knelt to build up the fire, that he had been first aware of a Midge who was not an affectionate child, but a woman. It had been an upsetting vision. He had felt for a moment that he had lost something, something that was a precious part of Ainswick, and he had said impulsively, speaking out of that sudden, aroused feeling, "'I wish I saw more of you, little Midge.' Standing outside in the moonlight, speaking to a Henrietta who was no longer, startlingly, the familiar Henrietta he had loved for so long, he had known sudden panic, and he had come into a further disturbance of the set pattern which was his life. Little Midge was also a part of Ainswick, and this was no longer Little Midge, but a courageous and sad-eyed adult whom he did not know. Ever since then he had been troubled in his mind, and had indulged in a good deal of self-reproach for the unthinking way in which he had never bothered about Midge's happiness or comfort. The idea of her uncongenial job at Madame Alfrege's had worried him more and more, and he had determined at last to see for himself just what this dress-shop of hers was like. Edward peered suspiciously into the show-window at a little black dress with a narrow gold belt, some rakish-looking skimpy jumper-suits, and an evening gown of rather tawdry coloured lace. Edward knew nothing about women's clothes, except by instinct, but he had a shrewd idea that all these exhibits were somehow of a meretricious order. No, he thought, this place was not worthy of her. Someone, Lady Angertel perhaps, must do something about it. Overcoming his shyness with an effort, Edward straightened his slightly stooping shoulders and walked in. He was instantly paralysed with embarrassment, Two platinum-blonde little minxes with shrill voices were examining dresses in a showcase, with a dark saleswoman in attendance. At the back of the shop, a small woman with a thick nose, henna-red hair, and a disagreeable voice was arguing with a stout and bewildered customer over some alterations to an evening gown. From an adjacent cubicle, a woman's fretful voice was raised. "'Frightful! Perfectly frightful! Can't you bring me anything decent to try?' In response, he heard the soft murmur of Midge's voice, a deferential, persuasive voice. "'This wine model is really very smart, and I think it would suit you if you'd just slip it on. I'm not going to waste my time trying on things that I can see are no good. Do take a little trouble. I've told you, I don't want reds. If you'd listen to what you're told—' The colour surged up into Edward's neck. He hoped Midge would throw the dress in the odious woman's face. Instead, she murmured, "'I'll have another look.' "'You wouldn't care for green, I suppose, madam? Or this peach? "'Dreadful! Perfectly dreadful! No! I won't see anything more! Sheer waste of time!' But now Madame Alfrege, detaching herself from the stout customer, had come down to Edward, and was looking at him inquiringly. He pulled himself together. "'Is—could uh, uh, I speak—is Miss Hardcastle here?' Madame Alfrege's eyebrows went up but she took in the Savile Row cut of Edward's clothes, and she produced a smile whose graciousness was rather more unpleasant than her bad temper would have been. From inside the cubicle the fretful voice rose sharply, "'Do be careful! How clumsy you are! You've torn my hair net! And Midge, her voice unsteady, "'I'm very sorry, madam. Stupid clumsiness! No, I I'll do it myself. My belt, please!' "'Miss Hardcastle will be free in a minute,' said Madame Alfrege. Her smile was now a leer. A sandy-haired, bad-tempered-looking woman emerged from the cubicle, carrying several parcels, and went out into the street. Midge, 
in a severe black dress, opened the door for her. She looked pale and unhappy. "'I've come to take you out to lunch,' said Edward, without preamble. Midge gave a harried glance up at the clock. "'I don't get off until quarter past one,' she began. It was ten past one. Madame Alfrege said graciously, "'You can go off now, if you like, Miss Hardcastle, as your friend has called for you.' Midge murmured, "'Oh, thank you, Madame Alfrege," and to Edward, "'I'll be ready in a minute,' and disappeared into the back of the shop. Edward, who had winced under the impact of Madame Alfrege's heavy emphasis on friend, stood helplessly waiting. Madame Alfrege was just about to enter into arch conversation with him when the door opened and an opulent-looking woman with a Pekingese came in, and Madame Alfrege's business instincts took her toward the newcomer. Midge reappeared with her coat on, and taking her by the elbow, Edward steered her out of the shop into the street. "'My God!' he said. "'Is that the sort of thing you have to put up with? I heard that damned woman talking to you behind the curtain. How can you stick it, Midge?' Why didn't you throw the damned frocks at her head? I'd soon lose my job if I did things like that. But don't you want to fling things at a woman of that kind? Midge drew a deep breath. Of course I do. And there are times, especially at the end of a hot week during the summer sales, when I am afraid that one day I shall just let go and tell everybody exactly where they get off, instead of, yes, madam, no, madam, I'll see if we have anything else, madam. Midge, dear little Midge, "'You can't put up with all this.' Midge laughed a little shakily. <laughs> "'Don't be upset, Edward. Why on earth did you have to come here? Why not ring up? I wanted to see for myself. I've been worried.' He paused, and then broke out, "'Why, Lucy wouldn't talk to a scullery maid the way that woman talked to you. It's all wrong that you should have to put up with insolence and rudeness. Good God, Midge, I'd like to take you right out of it all down to Ainswick.' I'd like to hail a taxi, bundle you into it, and take you down to Ainswick now by the 2.15. Midge stopped. Her assumed nonchalance fell from her. She had had a long, tiring morning with trying customers, and Madame at her most bullying. She turned on Edward with a sudden flare of resentment. Well, then, why don't you? There are plenty of taxis. He stared at her, taken aback by her sudden fury. She went on, her anger flaming up. Why do you have to come along and say these things? You don't mean them. Do you think it makes it any easier, after I've had a hell of a morning, to be reminded there are places like Ainswick? Do you think I'm grateful for you standing there and babbling about how much you'd like to take me out of it all? All very sweet and insincere. You don't really mean a word of it. Don't you know that I'd sell my soul to catch the 2.15 to Ainswick and get away from everything? I can't bear even to think of Ainswick. Do you understand? You mean well, Edward, but you're cruel— saying things, just saying things. They faced each other, seriously incommoding the lunchtime crowd in Shaftesbury Avenue, yet they were conscious of nothing but each other. Edward was staring at her like a man suddenly aroused from sleep. He said, All right, then, damn it. You're coming to Ainswick by the 2.15. He raised his stick and hailed a passing taxi. It drew into the curb. Edward opened the door, and Midge, slightly dazed, got in. Edward said, Paddington Station, to the driver, and followed her in. They sat in silence. Midge's lips were set together. Her eyes were defiant and mutinous. Edward stared straight ahead of him. As they waited for the traffic lights in Oxford Street, Midge said disagreeably, I seem to have called your bluff. Edward said shortly, It wasn't bluff. The taxi started forward again with a jerk. It was not until the taxi turned left in Edgware Road into Cambridge Terrace that Edward suddenly regained his normal attitude to life. He said, "'We can't catch the 2.15,' and tapping on the glass he said to the driver, "'Go to the Barclay.' Midge said coldly, "'Why can't we catch the 2.15? It's only twenty-five past one now.' Edward smiled at her. "'You haven't got any luggage, little Midge. No nightgowns or toothbrushes or country shoes.' There's a 4.15, you know. We'll have some lunch now, and talk things over. Midge sighed. That's so like you, Edward, to remember the practical side. Impulse doesn't carry you very far, does it? Oh, well, it was a nice dream while it lasted. She slipped her hand into his, and gave him her old smile. I'm sorry I stood on the pavement and abused you like a fishwife, she said, but you know, Edward, 
You were irritating. Yes, he said. I must have been. They went into the Barclay happily, side by side. They got a table by the window, and Edward ordered an excellent lunch. As they finished their chicken, Midge sighed and said, I ought to hurry back to the shop. My time's up. You're going to take a decent time over your lunch today, even if I have to go back and buy half the clothes in the shop. Dear Edward, you are really rather sweet. They ate crepe Suzette, and then the waiter brought them coffee. Edward stirred his sugar in with his spoon. He said gently, You really do love Ainswick, don't you? Must we talk about Ainswick? I've survived not catching the 215, and I quite realise that there isn't any question of the 415, but don't rub it in. Edward smiled. No, I'm not proposing that we catch the 415, but I am suggesting that you come to Ainswick, Midge. I'm suggesting that you come there for good, that is, if you can put up with me. She stared at him over the rim of her coffee cup, put it down with a hand that she managed to keep steady. What do you really mean, Edward? I'm suggesting that you should marry me, Midge. I don't suppose that I'm a very romantic proposition. I'm a dull dog. I know that. And not much good at anything. I just read books and potter around. But although I'm not a very exciting person, we've known each other a long time, and I think that Ainswick itself would, well, would compensate. I think you'd be happy at Ainswick, Midge. Will you come? Midge swallowed once or twice. Then she said, But I thought, Henrietta, and stopped. Edward said, his voice level and unemotional, Yes, I've asked Henrietta to marry me three times. Each time she has refused. Henrietta knows what she doesn't want. There was a silence, and then Edward said, Well, Midge, dear, what about it? Midge looked up at him. There was a catch in her voice. She said, It seems so extraordinary to be offered heaven on a plate, as it were, at the Barclay. His face lit up. He laid his hand over hers for a brief moment. Heaven on a plate, he said. So you feel like that about Ainswick? Oh, Midge, I'm glad. They sat there happily. Edward paid the bill and added an enormous tip. The people in the restaurant were thinning out. Midge said with an effort, We'll have to go. I suppose I'd better go back to Madame Alfrege. After all, she's counting on me. I can't just walk out. No, I suppose you'll have to go back and resign, or hand in your notice, or whatever you call it. You're not to go on working there, though. I won't have it. But first, I thought we'd better go to one of those shops in Bond Street, where they sell rings. Rings? It's usual, isn't it? Midge laughed. In the dimmed lighting of the jeweller's shop, Midge and Edward bent over trays of sparkling engagement rings, whilst a discreet salesman watched them benignantly. Edward said, pushing away a velvet-covered tray, are not emeralds. Henrietta in green tweeds, Henrietta in an evening dress, like Chinese jade. No, uh, not emeralds. Midge pushed away the tiny, stabbing pain at her heart. Choose for me, she said to Edward. He bent over the tray before them. He picked out a ring with a single diamond, not a very large stone, but a stone of beautiful colour and fire. I'd like this. Midge nodded. She loved this display of Edward's unerring and fastidious taste. She slipped it on her finger as Edward and the shopman drew aside. Edward wrote out a cheque for three hundred and forty-two pounds, and came back to Midge, smiling. He said, Let's go and be rude to Madame Alfrege. But, darling, I am so delighted! Lady Angertel stretched out a fragile hand to Edward and touched Midge softly with the other. You did quite right, Edward, to make her leave that horrid shop and bring her right down here. She'll stay here, of course, and be married from here. St. George's, you know, three miles by the road, though only a mile through the woods— but then one doesn't go to a wedding through woods, and I suppose it will have to be the vicar. Poor man, he has such dreadful colds in the head every autumn. The curate, now, has one of those high Anglican voices, and the whole thing would be far more impressive, and more religious, too, if you know what I mean. It is so hard to keep one's mind reverent when somebody is saying things through their noses. It was, Midge decided, a very Lucyish reception. 
It made her want to both laugh and cry. "'I'd love to be married from here, Lucy,' she said. "'Then that's settled, darling. Off-white satin, I think, and an ivory prayer-book, not a bouquet. Bridesmaids?' "'No, I don't want to fuss. Just a very quiet wedding. I know what you mean, darling, and I think perhaps you're right. With an autumn wedding, it's nearly always chrysanthemums. Such an uninspiring flower, I always think, and unless one takes a lot of time to choose them carefully, bridesmaids never match properly, and there's nearly always one terribly plain one who ruins the whole effect, but one has to have her because she's usually the bridegroom's sister. But, of course, Lady Angertel beamed, Edward hasn't got any sisters.' Uh, "'That seems to be one point in my favour, said Edward, smiling. "'But children are really the worst at weddings,' went on Lady Angertel, happily pursuing her own train of thought. "'Everyone says, how sweet, but, my dear, the anxiety. They step on the train, or else they howl for Nanny, and quite often they're sick. I always wonder how a girl can go up the aisle in a proper frame of mind while she's so uncertain about what is happening behind her. "'There needn't be anything happening behind me,' said Midge cheerfully. "'Not even a train. I can be married in a coat and skirt. Oh, no, Midge, that's so like a widow.' "'No, off-white satin, and not from Madame Alfrege's.' "'Certainly not from Madame Alfrege's,' said Edward. "'I shall take you to Mireille,' said Lady Angertel. "'My dear Lucy, I can't possibly afford Mireille.' "'Nonsense, Midge. Henry and I are going to give you your trousseau, and Henry, of course, will give you away. I do hope the band of his trousers won't be too tight. It's nearly two years since he last went to a wedding, and I shall wear—' Lady Angertel paused and closed her eyes. "'Yes, Lucy?' "'Hydrangea blue,' announced Lady Angertel, in a rapt voice. "'I suppose, Edward, you will have one of your own friends for best man. Otherwise, of course, there is David. I cannot help feeling it would be frightfully good for David. It would give him poise, you know, and he would feel that we all liked him. That, I'm sure, is very important with David. It must be disheartening, you know, to feel you're clever and intellectual, and yet nobody likes you any the better for it. But, of course, it would be rather a risk. He would probably lose the ring or drop it at the last minute. I expect it would worry Edward too much, but it would be nice in a way to keep it to the same people we've had here for the murder. Lady Angertel uttered the last words in the most conversational of tones. Lady Angertel has been entertaining a few friends for a murder this autumn, Midge could not help saying. Yes, said Lucy meditatively. I suppose it did sound like that. A party for the shooting. You know, when you come to think of it, that's just what it has been. Midge gave a faint shiver and said, "'Well, at any rate, it's over now. "'It's not exactly over. "'The inquest was only adjourned, "'and that nice Inspector Grange has got men all over the place, "'simply crashing through the chestnut woods "'and startling all the pheasants "'and springing up like jacks in the box "'in the most unlikely places.' "'What are they looking for?' asked Edward. "'The revolver that Christo was shot with. "'I imagine that must be it. "'They even came to the house with the search warrant. "'The inspector was most apologetic about it, quite shy, "'but, of course, I told him we should be delighted. "'It was really most interesting.' They looked absolutely everywhere. I followed them round, you know, and I suggested one or two places, which even they hadn't thought of. But they didn't find anything. It was most disappointing. Poor Inspector Grange. He is growing quite thin, and he pulls and pulls at that moustache of his. His wife ought to give him specially nourishing meals, with all this worry he's having. But I have a vague idea that she must be one of those women who care more about having the linoleum really well polished than in cooking a tasty little meal, which reminds me, I must go and see Mrs. Medway. Funny how servants cannot bear the police— her cheese souffle last night was quite uneatable. Souffles and pastry always show if one is off balance. If it weren't for Gudgeon keeping them all together, I really believe half the servants would leave. Why don't you two go and have a nice walk, and help the police look for the revolver? Hercule Poirot sat on the bench overlooking the chestnut groves above the pool. He had no sense of trespassing, since Lady Angertel had very sweetly begged him to wander where he would at any time. It was Lady Angertel's sweetness which Hercule Poirot was considering at this moment. From time to time he heard the cracking of twigs in the woods above, or caught sight of a figure moving through the chestnut groves below him. Presently Henrietta came along the path from the direction of the lane. She stopped for a moment when she saw Poirot. Then she came and sat down by him. "'Good morning, Monsieur Poirot. "'I've just been to call upon you, but you were out.' You look very Olympian. Are you presiding over the hunt? The inspector seems very active. What are they looking for? The revolver? Yes, Miss Savernick. Will they find it, do you think? I think so. Quite soon now, I should say. She looked at him inquiringly. Have you an idea, then, where it is? 
No, uh, but I think it will be found soon. It is time for it to be found. You do say odd things, Monsieur Poirot. Odd things happen here. You have come back very soon from London, mademoiselle. Her face hardened. She gave a short, bitter laugh. The murderer returns to the scene of the crime. <laughs> that is the old superstition, isn't it? So you do think that I did it? You don't believe me when I tell you that I wouldn't, that I couldn't kill anybody. Poirot did not answer at once. At last he said thoughtfully, It has seemed to me from the beginning that either this crime was very simple, so simple that it was difficult to believe its simplicity, and simplicity, mademoiselle, can be strangely baffling, or else it was extremely complex. That is to say, we were contending against a mind capable of intricate and ingenious inventions, so that every time we seemed to be heading for the truth, we were actually being led on a trail that twisted away from the truth, and led us to a point which ended in nothingness. This apparent futility, this continual barrenness, is not real. It is artificial. It is planned. A very subtle and ingenious mind is plotting against us the whole time, and succeeding. Well, said Henrietta, what has that got to do with me? The mind that is plotting against us is a creative mind, mademoiselle. I see. That's where I come in. She was silent, her lips set together bitterly. From her jacket pocket she had taken a pencil, and now she was idly drawing the outline of a fantastic tree on the white-painted wood of the bench, frowning as she did so. Poirot watched her. Something stirred in his mind. Standing in Lady Angertel's drawing-room on the afternoon of the crime, looking down at a pile of bridge-markers, standing by a painted iron table in the pavilion the next morning, and a question that he had put to Gudgeon. He said, "'That is what you drew on your bridge-marker. A tree?' "'Yes,' Henrietta seemed suddenly aware of what she was doing. "'Igdrasil, Monsieur Poirot,' she laughed. "'Why do you call it Igdrasil?' She explained the origin of Igdrasil. "'And so when you doodle, uh, that is the word, is it not? It is always Igdrasil you draw? Yes. Doodling is a funny thing, isn't it? Here, on the seat, on the bridge-marker, on Saturday evening, in the pavilion, on Sunday morning.' The hand that held the pencil stiffened and stopped. She said in a tone of careless amusement, "'In the pavilion?' "'Yes.' on the round iron table there. Oh, that must have been on, uh, on Saturday afternoon. It was not on Saturday afternoon. When Gudgeon brought the glasses out to the pavilion at about twelve o'clock on Sunday morning, there was nothing drawn on the table. I asked him, and he is quite definite about that. Then it must have been, she hesitated for just a moment, of course, on Sunday afternoon. But still smiling pleasantly, Hercule Poirot shook his head, I think not. Grange's men were at the pool all Sunday afternoon, photographing the body, getting the revolver out of the water. They did not leave until dusk. They would have seen anyone go into the pavilion. Henrietta said slowly, I remember now. I went along there quite late in the evening, after dinner. Poirot's voice came sharply. People do not doodle in the dark, Miss Savernick. Are you telling me that you went into the pavilion at night, and stood by a table, and drew a tree, without being able to see what you were drawing? Henrietta said calmly, I am telling you the truth. Naturally, you don't believe it. You have your own ideas. What is your idea, by the way? I am suggesting that you were in the pavilion on Sunday morning, after twelve o'clock, when Gudgeon brought the glasses out. That you stood by that table— watching someone, or waiting for someone, and unconsciously took out a pencil and drew Yggdrasil, without being fully aware of what you were doing. I was not in the pavilion on Sunday morning. I sat out on the terrace for a while, then I got the gardening basket, and went up to the Dahlia border, and cut off heads and tied up some of the Michaelmas daisies that were untidy. Then, just on one o'clock, I went along to the pool. I have been through it all with Inspector Grange. I never came near the pool until one o'clock, just after John had been shot. That, said Hercule Poirot, is your story. But Yggdrasil, mademoiselle, testifies against you. 
I was in the pavilion, and I shot John. That's what you mean. You were there, and you shot Dr. Christo, or you were there, and you saw who shot Dr. Christo, or someone else was there who knew about Yggdrasil and deliberately drew it on the table to put suspicion on you. Henrietta got up. She turned on him with her chin lifted. You still think that I shot John Christo? You think you can prove I shot him? Well, I'll tell you this. You will never prove it. Never. You think you are cleverer than I am? You will never prove it, said Henrietta, and turning, she walked away down the winding path that led to the swimming pool. Grange came into Rest Haven to drink a cup of tea with Hercule Poirot. The tea was exactly what he had had apprehensions it might be, extremely weak, and china tea at that. These foreigners, thought Grange, don't know how to make tea. You can't teach him. But he did not mind much. He was in a condition of pessimism when one more thing that was unsatisfactory actually afforded him a kind of grim satisfaction. He said, The adjourned inquest's the day after tomorrow. And where have we got? Nowhere at all. What the hell? That gun must be somewhere. It's this damn country, miles of woods. It would take an army to search them properly. Talk of a needle in a haystack. Maybe anywhere. The fact is, we've got to face up to it. We may never find that gun. You will find it, said Poirot confidently. Well, it won't be for want of trying. You will find it sooner or later, and I should say sooner. Another cup of tea. Oh, I don't mind if I do. Uh, no, no, no hot water. It is not too strong? Oh, no, it's not too strong. The inspector was conscious of understatement. Gloomily, he sipped at the pale, straw-coloured beverage. This case is making a monkey of me, Monsieur Poirot, a monkey of me. I can't get the hang of these people. They seem helpful, but everything they tell you seems to lead you away on a wild goose chase. Away? said Poirot. A startled look came into his eyes. Yes, I see. Away. The inspector was now developing his grievance. Take the gun now. Christo was shot, according to the medical evidence, only a minute or two before your arrival. Lady Angertel had that egg basket. Miss Savernake had a gardening basket full of dead flower heads, and Edward Angertel was wearing a loose shooting coat with large pockets stuffed with cartridges. Any one of them could have carried the revolver away with them. It wasn't hidden anywhere near the pool. My men have raked the place, so that's definitely out. Poirot nodded. Grange went on. Gerda Christo was framed. But who by? That's where every clue I follow seems to vanish into thin air. Their stories of how they spent the morning are satisfactory? Well, the stories are all right. Miss Savernake was gardening, Lady Angertel was collecting eggs, Edward Angertel and Sir Henry were shooting and separated at the end of the morning, Sir Henry coming back to the house, and Edward Angertel coming down here through the woods. The young fellow was up in his bedroom reading. Funny place to read on a nice day, but he's the indoor bookish kind. Miss Hardcastle took a book down to the orchard. All sounds very natural and likely, and there's no means of checking up on it. Gudgeon took a tray of glasses out to the pavilion about twelve o'clock. He can't say where any of the house party were or what they were doing. In a way, you know, there's something against almost all of them. Really? Of course, the most obvious person is Veronica Cray. She had quarrelled with Christo. She hated his guts. She's quite likely to have shot him but I can't find the least iota of proof that she did shoot him. No evidence as to where having had any opportunity to pinch the revolvers from Sir Henry's collection. No one who saw her going to or from the pool that day, and the missing revolver definitely isn't in her possession now. Ah, you have made sure of that? Well, what do you think? The evidence would have justified a search warrant, but there was no need. She was quite gracious about it. It's not anywhere in that tin-pot bungalow. After the inquest was adjourned, we made a show of letting up on Miss Cray and Miss Savernake, and we've had a tail on them to see where they went and what they do. We've had a man on at the film studios watching Veronica. No sign of her trying to ditch the gun there. And Henrietta Savernake? Nothing there, either. She went straight back to Chelsea, and we've kept an eye on her ever since. The revolver isn't in her studio or in her possession. She was quite pleasant about the search, seemed amused. Some of her fancy stuff gave our man quite a turn. He said it beat him why people wanted to do that kind of thing. 
statues, all lumps and swellings, bits of brass and aluminium twisted into fancy shapes, horses that you wouldn't know were horses. Poirot stirred a little. Horses, you say? Well, a horse, if you'd call it a horse. If people want to model a horse, why don't they go and look at a horse? A horse, repeated Poirot. Grange turned his head. What is there about that that interests you so, Monsieur Poirot? I don't get it. Association. A point of the psychology. Word association. Horse and cart, rocking horse, clothes horse. No, I don't get it. Anyway, after a day or two, Miss Savernake packs up and comes down here again. You know that? Yes, I have talked with her, and I have seen her walking in the woods. Restless, yes. Well, she was having an affair with the doctor, all right, and his saying Henrietta as he died is pretty near to an accusation. But it's not quite near enough, Monsieur Poirot. No, said Poirot thoughtfully, it is not near enough. Grange said heavily, There's something in the atmosphere here. It gets you all tangled up. It's as though they all knew something. Lady Angertel now. She's never been able to put out a decent reason why she took out a gun with her that day. It's a crazy thing to do. Sometimes I think she is crazy. Poirot shook his head very gently. No, he said, she is not crazy. Then there's Edward Angertel. I thought I was getting something on him. Lady Angertel said, well, no, hinted, that he'd been in love with Miss Savernake for years. Well, that gives him a motive. And now I find it's the other girl, Miss Hardcastle, that he's engaged to. So bang goes the case against him. Poirot gave a sympathetic murmur. Then there's the young fellow, pursued the inspector. Lady Angertel let slip something about him. His mother, it seems, died in an asylum, persecution mania. Thought everybody was conspiring to kill her. Well, you can see what that might mean. If the boy had inherited that particular strain of insanity, he might have got ideas into his head about Dr. Christo. Might have fancied the doctor was planning to certify him. Not that Christo was that kind of doctor. Nervous affections of the alimentary canal and diseases of the super... super something. That was Christo's line. But if the boy was a bit touched, he might imagine Christo was here to keep him under observation. He's got an extraordinary manner, that young fellow. Nervous as a cat. Grange sat unhappily for a moment or two. You see what I mean? All vague suspicions leading nowhere. Poirot stirred again. He murmured softly, Away, not towards, from, not to, nowhere instead of somewhere. Yes, of course, that must be it. Grange stared at him. He said, They're queer, all these Angertels. I'd swear sometimes that they know all about it. Poirot said quietly, They do. Oh, you mean, they know, all of them, who did it? The inspector asked incredulously. Poirot nodded. Yes, they know. I have thought so for some time. I am quite sure now. I see. The inspector's face was grim, and they're hiding it up between them. Well, I'll beat them yet. I'm going to find that gun. It was, Poirot reflected, quite the inspector's theme song. Grange went on with rancour. I'd give anything to get even with them. With all of them. Muddling me up, suggesting things, hinting, helping my men, helping them. <laughs> all gossamer and spider's webs, nothing tangible. When what I want is a good solid fact. Hercule Poirot had been staring out of the window for some moments. His eye had been attracted by an irregularity in the symmetry of his domain. He said now, You want a solid fact, eh bien? Unless I am much mistaken, there is a solid fact in the hedge by my gate. They went down the garden path. Grange went down on his knees, coaxed the twigs apart, till he disclosed more fully the thing that had been thrust between them. He drew a deep sigh, as something black and steel was revealed. He said, It's a revolver, all right. Just for a moment, his eye rested doubtfully on Poirot. No, no, my friend, said Poirot. I did not shoot Dr. Christo, and I did not put the revolver in my own hedge. Of course you didn't, Monsieur Poirot. Sorry. Uh, well, we've got it. Looks like the one missing from Sir Henry's study. We can verify that as soon as we get the number. 
Then we'll see if it was the gun that shot Christo. Easy does it now. With infinite care and the use of a silk handkerchief, he eased the gun out of the hedge. To give us a break, we want fingerprints. I've a feeling, you know, that our luck's changed at last. Let me know. Of course I will, Monsieur Poirot. I'll ring you up. Poirot received two telephone calls. The first came through that same evening. The inspector was jubilant. That you, Monsieur Poirot? Well, here's the dope. It's the gun, all right. The gun missing from Sir Henry's collection and the gun that shot John Christo. That's definite. And there are a good set of prints on it. Thumb, first finger, part of middle finger. Didn't I tell you our luck had changed? You have identified the fingerprints? Not yet. They're certainly not Mrs. Christo's. We took hers. They look more like a man's than a woman's for size. Tomorrow, I'm going along to the hollow to speak my little piece and get a sample from everyone. And then, Monsieur Poirot, we shall know where we are. I hope so. I am sure, said Poirot politely. The second telephone call came through on the following day, and the voice that spoke was no longer jubilant. In tones of unmitigated gloom, Grange said, "'Want to hear the latest? Those fingerprints aren't the prints of anybody connected with the case. No, sir. They're not Edward Angertel's, nor David's, nor Sir Henry's. They're not Gerda Christo's, nor the Seven Aches, nor our Veronica's, nor her ladyship's, nor the little dark girl's. They're not even the kitchen maids, let alone any of the other servants.' Poirot made consoling noises. The sad voice of Inspector Grange went on. So, it looks as though, after all, it was an outside job. Someone, that is to say, who had a down on Dr. Christo, and who we don't know anything about. Someone invisible and inaudible, who pinched the guns from the study, and who went away after the shooting by the path to the lane. Someone who put the gun in your hedge, and then vanished into thin air. Would you like my fingerprints, my friend? said Poirot. I don't mind if I do. It strikes me, Monsieur Poirot, that you were on the spot, and that taking it all around, you're far and away the most suspicious character in the case. The coroner cleared his throat, and looked expectantly at the foreman of the jury. The latter looked down at the piece of paper he held in his hand. His Adam's apple wagged up and down excitedly. He read out in a careful voice, A we find that the deceased came to his death by willful murder by some person or persons unknown. Poirot nodded his head quietly in his corner by the wall. There could be no other possible verdict. Outside, the Angertels stopped a moment to talk to Gerda and her sister. Gerda was wearing the same black clothes. Her face had the same dazed, unhappy expression. This time there was no Daimler. The train service, Elsie Patterson explained, was really very good, a fast train to Waterloo, and they could easily catch the one twenty to Bexhill. Lady Angertel, clasping Gerda's hand, murmured, You must keep in touch with us, my dear. A little lunch, perhaps, one day in London? I expect you'll come up to do shopping, occasionally. I... I don't know, said Gerda. Elsie Patterson said, We must hurry, dear, our train, and Gerda turned away with an expression of relief. Midge said, Poor Gerda. The only thing John's death has done for her is to set her free from your terrifying hospitality, Lucy. How unkind you are, Midge! Nobody could say I didn't try. You are much worse when you try, Lucy. Well, it's very nice to think it's all over, isn't it? said Lady Angertel, beaming at them. Except, of course, for poor Inspector Grange. I do feel sorry for him. Would it cheer him up, do you think, if we asked him back to lunch? As a friend, I mean. I should uh, let well alone, Lucy, said Sir Henry. "'Perhaps you're right,' said Lady Angertel meditatively. "'And anyway, it isn't the right kind of lunch today. "'Partridges au chou, and that delicious souffle surprise "'that Mrs. Medway makes so well, not at all Inspector Grange's kind of lunch. "'A really good steak, a little underdone, and a good old-fashioned apple tart "'with no nonsense about it, or perhaps apple dumplings. "'That's what I should order for Inspector Grange.' "'Your instincts about food are always very sound, Lucy. "'I think we had better get home to those partridges. "'They sound delicious.' "'Well, I thought we ought to have some celebration. "'It's wonderful, isn't it? "'How everything always seems to turn out for the best.' Uh, "'Yes.' "'I know what you're thinking, Henry, but don't worry. "'I shall attend to it this afternoon.' "'What are you up to now, Lucy?' "'Lady Angertel smiled at him. "'It's quite all right, darling. "'Just tucking in a loose end.' "'Sir Henry looked at her doubtfully. "'When they reached the hollow, "'Gudgeon came out to open the door of the car. 
Everything went off very satisfactorily, Gudgeon, said Lady Angertel. Please tell Mrs. Medway and the others. I know how unpleasant it has been for you all, and I should like to tell you how much Sir Henry and I have appreciated the loyalty you've all shown. We have been deeply concerned for you, my lady, said Gudgeon. Very sweet of you, Gudgeon, said Lucy, as she went into the drawing-room, but really quite wasted. I have really almost enjoyed it all. So different, you know, from what one is accustomed to. Don't you feel, David, that an experience like this has broadened your mind? It must be so different from Cambridge. I am at Oxford, said David coldly. Lady Angertel said vaguely, The dear boat race, so English, don't you think? And went towards the telephone. She picked up the receiver, and holding it in her hand, she went on, I do hope, David, that you will come and stay with us again. It's so difficult, isn't it, to get to know people when there is a murder, and quite impossible to have any really intellectual conversation. Thank you, said David, but when I come down, I am going to Athens, to the British school. Lady Angertel turned to her husband. Who's got the embassy now? Oh, of course, Hope Remington. No, I don't think David would like them. Those girls of theirs are so terribly hearty. They play hockey and cricket, and the funny game where you catch the thing in a net. She broke off, looking down at the telephone receiver. Now, what am I doing with this thing? Perhaps you were going to ring someone up, said Edward. I don't think so. She replaced it. Do you like telephones, David? It was the sort of question, David reflected irritably, that she would ask, one to which there could be no intelligent answer. He replied coldly that he supposed they were useful. You mean, said Lady Angertel, like mincing machines, or elastic bands? All the same one wouldn't— She broke off as Gudgeon appeared in the doorway to announce lunch. But you like partridges, said Lady Angertel to David anxiously. David admitted that he liked partridges. Sometimes I think Lucy really is a bit touched said Midge, as she and Edward strolled away from the house and up towards the woods. The partridges and the souffle surprise had been excellent, and with the inquest over, a weight had lifted from the atmosphere. Edward said thoughtfully, I always think Lucy has a brilliant mind that expresses itself like a missing word competition. To mix metaphors, the hammer jumps from nail to nail, and never fails to hit each one squarely on the head. All the same, Midge said soberly, Lucy frightens me sometimes. She added with a tiny shiver, This place has frightened me lately. The hollow? Edward turned an astonished face to her. It always reminds me a little of Ainswick, he said. It's not, of course, the real thing. Midge interrupted. That's just it, Edward. I'm frightened of things that aren't the real thing. You don't know, you see, what's behind them. It's like, oh, it's like a mask. You mustn't be fanciful, little Midge. It was the old tone, the indulgent tone he had used years ago. She had liked it then, but now it disturbed her. She struggled to make her meaning clear, to show him that behind what he called fancy was some shape of dimly apprehended reality. I got away from it in London, but now that I am back here it all comes over me again. I feel that everyone knows who killed John Christo, that the only person who doesn't know is me. Edward said irritably, "'Must we think and talk about John Christo? He's dead, dead and gone,' Midge murmured. "'He is dead and gone, lady. He is dead and gone. At his head a grass-green turf, at his heels a stone.' She put her hand on Edward's arm. "'Who did kill him, Edward? We thought it was Gerda, but it wasn't Gerda. Then who was it?' Tell me what you think. Was it someone we've never heard of? He said irritably, All this speculation seems to me quite unprofitable. If the police can't find out or can't get sufficient evidence, then the whole thing will have to be allowed to drop, and we shall be rid of it. Yes, but it's the not knowing. Why should we want to know? What has John Christo to do with us? With us, she thought, with Edward and me. Nothing. Comforting thought. She and Edward linked a dual identity. And yet, and yet, John Christo, for all that he had been laid in his grave and the words of the burial service read over him, was not buried deep enough. He is dead and gone, lady. But John Christo was not dead and gone, for all that Edward wished him to be. John Christo was still here at the hollow. Edward said, Where are we going? Something in his tone surprised her. She said, 
Let's walk up to the top of the ridge, shall we? If you like. For some reason he was unwilling. She wondered why. It was usually his favourite walk. He and Henrietta used nearly always— Her thought snapped and broke off. He and Henrietta. She said, Have you been this way yet this autumn? He said stiffly, Henrietta and I walked up here that first afternoon. They went on in silence. They came at last to the top and sat on the fallen tree. Midge thought, He and Henrietta sat here, perhaps? She turned the ring on her finger round and round. The diamond flashed coldly at her. Not emeralds, he had said. She said with a slight effort, It will be lovely to be at Ainswick again for Christmas. He did not seem to hear her. He had gone far away. She thought, He is thinking of Henrietta and of John Christo. Sitting here, he had said something to Henrietta, or she had said something to him. Henrietta might know what she didn't want, but he belonged to Henrietta still. He always would, Midge thought, belong to Henrietta. Pain swooped down upon her. The happy bubble world in which she had lived for the last week quivered and broke. She thought, I can't live like that, with Henrietta always there in his mind. I can't face it. I can't bear it. The wind sighed through the trees. The leaves were falling fast now. There was hardly any golden left, only brown. She said, Edward. The urgency of her voice aroused him. He turned his head. Yes? I'm sorry, Edward. Her lips were trembling, but she forced her voice to be quiet and self-controlled. I've got to tell you, it's no use. I can't marry you. It wouldn't work, Edward, he said. But Midge, surely Ainswick, she interrupted. I can't marry you just for Ainswick, Edward. You, you must see that. He sighed then, a long, gentle sigh. It was like an echo of the dead leaves slipping gently off the branches of the trees. I see what you mean, he said. Yes, I suppose you are right. It was dear of you to ask me, dear and sweet, but it wouldn't do, Edward. It wouldn't work. She had had a faint hope, perhaps, that he would argue with her, that he would try to persuade her, but he seemed quite simply to feel just as she did about it. Here, with the ghost of Henrietta close beside him, he too, apparently, saw that it couldn't work. No, he said, echoing her words, it wouldn't work. She slipped the ring off her finger and held it out to him. She would always love Edward, and Edward would always love Henrietta, and life was just plain, unadulterated hell. She said with a little catch in her voice, It's a lovely ring, Edward. I wish you'd keep it, Midge. I'd like you to have it. She shook her head. I, I couldn't do that, he said with a faint, humorous twist of the lips. I shan't give it to anyone else, you know. It was all quite friendly. He didn't know. He would never know just what she was feeling. Heaven on a plate. And the plate was broken, and heaven had slipped between her fingers, or had, perhaps, never been there. That afternoon Poirot received his third visitor. He had been visited by Henrietta Savonake and Veronica Cray. This time it was Lady Angertel. She came floating up the path with her usual appearance of insubstantiality. He opened the door, and she stood smiling at him. "'I have come to see you,' she announced. So might a fairy confer a favour on a mere mortal. "'I am enchanted, madame.' He led the way into the sitting-room. She sat down on the sofa, and once more she smiled. Hercule Poirot thought, "'She is old. Her hair is grey. There are lines in her face, yet she has magic. She will always have magic.' Lady Angertel said softly, "'I want you to do something for me.' "'Yes, Lady Angertel? To begin with, I must talk to you about John Christo.' "'About Dr. Christo? Yes, it seems to me that the only thing to do is to put a full stop to this whole thing.' You understand what I mean, don't you? I am not sure that I do know what you mean, Lady Angertel. She gave him her lovely, dazzling smile again, and she put one long white hand on his sleeve. Dear Monsieur Poirot, you know perfectly. The police will have to hunt about for the owner of those fingerprints, and they won't find him. And they'll have in the end to let the whole thing drop. But I'm afraid, you know, that you won't let it drop. No, I shall not let it drop. That is just what I thought, and that is why I came. It's the truth you want, isn't it? Certainly, I want the truth. I see I haven't explained myself very well. I'm trying to find out just why 
you won't let things drop. It isn't because of your prestige or because you want to hang a murderer, such an unpleasant kind of death I've always thought, so medieval. It's just, I think, that you want to know. You do see what I mean, don't you? If you were to know the truth, if you were to be told the truth, I think, I think perhaps that might satisfy you. Would it satisfy you, Monsieur Poirot? You are offering to tell me the truth, Lady Angata? She nodded. You yourself know the truth, then? Her eyes opened very wide. Oh, yes, I've known for a long time. I'd like to tell you, and then we could agree that, well, it was all over and done with. She smiled at him. Is it a bargain, Monsieur Poirot? It was quite an effort for Hercule Poirot to say, No, madame, it is not a bargain. He wanted, he wanted very badly to let the whole thing drop, simply because Lady Angatel had asked him to do so. Lady Angatel sat very still for a moment. Then she raised her eyebrows. I wonder, she said, I wonder if you really know what you are doing. Midge, lying dry-eyed and awake in the darkness, turned restlessly on her pillows. She heard a door unlatch, a footstep in the corridor outside passing her door. It was Edward's door, and Edward's step. She switched on the lamp by her bed, and looked at the clock that stood by the lamp on the table. It was ten minutes to three. Edward, passing her door, and going down the stairs at this hour in the morning. It was odd. They had all gone to bed early at half-past ten. She herself had not slept, had lain there with burning eyelids and with a dry, aching misery racking her feverishly. She had heard the clock strike downstairs, had heard owls hoot outside her bedroom window, had felt that depression that reaches its nadir at about two a.m., had thought to herself, I can't bear it, I can't bear it, tomorrow coming, another day, day after day to be got through banished by her own act from Ainswick, from all the loveliness and dearness of Ainswick, which might have been her very own possession. But better banishment, better loneliness, better a drab and uninteresting life than life with Edward and Henrietta's ghost. Until that day in the woods she had not known her own capacity for bitter jealousy, and after all Edward had never told her that he loved her. Affection, kindliness, he had never pretended to more than that, she had accepted the limitation, and not until she had realized what it would mean to live at close quarters with an Edward whose mind and heart had Henrietta as a permanent guest did she know that for her Edward's affection was not enough. Edward walking past her door, down the front stairs, it was odd, very odd. Where was he going? Uneasiness grew upon her. It was all part and parcel of the uneasiness that the hollow gave her nowadays. What was Edward doing downstairs in the small hours of the morning? Had he gone out? Inactivity at last became too much for her. She got up, slipped on her dressing gown, and taking a torch she opened her door and came out into the passage. It was quite dark. No light had been switched on. Midge turned to the left and came to the head of the staircase. Below all was dark, too. She ran down the stairs, and after a moment's hesitation switched on the light in the hall. Everything was silent. The front door was closed and locked. She tried the side door, but that too was locked. Edward, then, had not gone out. Where could he be? And suddenly she raised her head and sniffed. A whiff, a very faint whiff of gas. The bay's door to the kitchen quarters was just ajar. She went through it. A faint light was shining from the open kitchen door. The smell of gas was much stronger. Midge ran along the passage and into the kitchen. Edward was lying on the floor with his head inside the gas oven, which was turned full on. Midge was a quick, practical girl. Her first act was to swing open the shutters. She could not unlatch the window, and winding a glass cloth round her arm, she smashed it. Then, holding her breath, she stooped down, and tugged and pulled Edward out of the gas oven, and switched off the taps. He was unconscious and breathing queerly, but she knew that he could not have been unconscious long. He could only just have gone under— the wind sweeping through from the window to the open door was fast dispelling the gas fumes. Midge dragged Edward to a spot near the window where the air would have full play. She sat down and gathered him into her strong young arms. She said his name, first softly, then with increasing desperation. Edward! 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 He stirred, groaned, opened his eyes, and looked up at her. He said very faintly, Gas oven! And his eyes, 
went round to the gas stove. I know, darling, but why? Why? He was shivering now. His hands were cold and lifeless. He said, Midge? There was a kind of wondering surprise and pleasure in his voice. She said, I heard you pass my door. I didn't know. I, I came down. He sighed, a very long sigh, as though from very far away. Best way out, he said. And then, inexplicably, until she remembered Lucy's conversation on the night of the tragedy, news of the world. But, Edward, why? Why? He looked up at her, and the blank, cold darkness of his stare frightened her. Because I know I've never been any good. Always a failure, always ineffectual. It's men like Christo who do things. They get there, and women admire them. I'm nothing. I'm not even quite alive. I inherited Ainswick, and I've enough to live on. Otherwise I would have gone under. No good at a career, never much good as a writer. Henrietta didn't want me. No one wanted me. That day at the Barclay, I thought, but it was the same story. You couldn't care either, Midge, even for Ainswick. You couldn't put up with me. So I thought I'd better get out altogether. Her words came with a rush. Darling, darling, you don't understand. It was because of Henrietta, because I thought you still loved Henrietta so much. Henrietta? He murmured it vaguely, as though speaking of someone infinitely remote. Yes, I loved her very much. And from even farther away she heard him murmur, It's so cold. Edward, my darling! Her arms closed around him firmly. He smiled at her, murmuring, You're so warm, Midge. You're so warm. Yes, she thought. That was what despair was. A cold thing, a thing of infinite coldness and loneliness. She'd never understood until now that despair was a cold thing. She had thought of it somehow as hot and passionate, something violent, a hot-blooded desperation. But that was not so. This was despair this utter, outer darkness of coldness and loneliness. And the sin of despair that priests talked of was a cold sin, the sin of cutting oneself off from all warm and living human contacts. Edward said again, You're so warm, Midge. And suddenly, with a glad, proud confidence, she thought, But that's what he wants. That's what I can give him. They were all cold, the anger tells. Even Henrietta had something in her of the will-o'-the-wisp, of the elusive fairy coldness in the anger tell blood. Let Edward love Henrietta as an intangible and unpossessable dream. It was warmth, permanence, stability that was his real need. It was daily companionship and love and laughter at Ainswick. She thought, what Edward needs is someone to light a fire on his hearth, and I am the person to do that. Edward looked up. He saw Midge's face bending over him, the warm colouring of her skin, the generous mouth, the steady eyes, and the dark hair that lay back from her forehead like two wings. He saw Henrietta always as a projection from the past. In the grown woman he sought and wanted only to see the seventeen-year-old girl he had first loved. But now, looking up at Midge, he had a queer sense of seeing a continuous Midge. He saw the schoolgirl, with her winged hair springing back into two pigtails. He saw its dark waves framing her face now, and he saw exactly how those wings would look when the hair was not dark any longer, but grey. Midge, he thought, is real. The only real thing I have ever known. He felt the warmth of her, and the strength. Dark, positive, alive, real. Midge, he thought, is the rock on which I can build my life. He said, Darling Midge, I love you so. Never leave me again. She bent down to him, and he felt the warmth of her lips on his, felt her love enveloping him, shielding him, and happiness flowering in that cold desert where he had lived alone so long. Suddenly Midge said with a shaky laugh, Look, Edward, a black beetle has just come out to look at us. Isn't he a nice black beetle? I never thought I could like a black beetle so much. She added dreamily, How odd life is. Here we are, sitting on the floor in a kitchen that still smells of gas, all amongst the black beetles, and feeling that it's heaven. He murmured dreamily, I could stay here forever. 
We'd better go and get some sleep. It's four o'clock. How on earth are we going to explain that broken window to Lucy? Fortunately, Midge reflected, Lucy was an extraordinarily easy person to explain things to. Taking a leaf out of Lucy's own book, Midge went into her room at six o'clock. She made a bald statement of fact. Edward went down and put his head in the gas oven in the night, she said. Fortunately, I heard him and went down after him. I broke the window because I couldn't get it open quickly. Lucy, Midge had to admit, was wonderful. She smiled sweetly with no sign of surprise. Dear Midge, she said, you are always so practical. I am sure you will always be the greatest comfort to Edward. After Midge had gone, Lady Angertel lay thinking. Then she got up and went into her husband's room, which for once was unlocked. Henry! My dear Lucy, it's not cockcrow yet. No, but listen. Henry, this is really important. We must have electricity installed to cook by and get rid of that gas stove. Why? It's, it's quite satisfactory, isn't it? Oh, yes, dear. But it's the sort of thing that gives people ideas, and everybody mightn't be as practical as dear Midge. She flitted elusively away. Sir Henry turned over with a grunt. Presently he awoke with a start, just as he was dozing off. <laughs> did I dream it? he murmured. Or did Lucy come in and start talking about gas stoves? Outside in the passage, Lady Angertel went into the bathroom and put a kettle on the gas ring. Sometimes, she knew, people liked an early cup of tea. Fired with self-approval, she returned to bed and lay back on her pillows, pleased with life and with herself. Edward and Midge at Ainswick. The inquest over. She would go and talk to Monsieur Poirot again. A nice little man. Suddenly, another idea flashed into her head. She sat upright in bed. I wonder now she speculated. If she has thought of that! She got out of bed and drifted along the passage to Henrietta's room, beginning her remarks as usual, long before she was within earshot. And it suddenly came to me, dear, that you might have overlooked that. Henrietta murmured sleepily, Oh, for heaven's sake, Lucy! The birds aren't up yet! Oh, I know, dear, it is rather early, but it seems to have been a very disturbed night, Edward in the gas stove, and Midge in the kitchen window, and thinking of what to say to Monsieur Poirot and everything— I'm sorry, Lucy, but everything you say sounds like complete gibberish. Can't it wait? It was only the holster, dear. I thought, you know, that you might not have thought about the holster. Holster? Henrietta sat up in bed. She was suddenly wide awake. What's this about a holster? That revolver of Henry's was in a holster, you know, and the holster hasn't been found, and, of course, nobody may think of it, but on the other hand, somebody might. Henrietta swung herself out of bed. She said, one always forgets something. That's what they say. And it's true. Lady Angertel went back to her room. She got into bed and quickly went fast asleep. The kettle on the gas ring boiled and went on boiling. Gerda rolled over to the side of the bed and sat up. Her head felt a little better now, but she was still glad that she hadn't gone with the others on the picnic. It was peaceful and almost comforting to be alone in the house for a bit. Elsie, of course, had been very kind, very kind, especially at first. To begin with, Gerda had been urged to stay in bed for breakfast. Trays had been brought up to her. Everybody urged her to sit in the most comfortable armchair, to put her feet up, not to do anything at all strenuous. They were all so sorry for her about John. She had stayed cowering gratefully in that protective, dim haze. She hadn't wanted to think, or to feel, or to remember. But now— Every day she felt it coming nearer. She'd have to start living again, to decide what to do, where to live. Already Elsie was showing a shade of impatience in her manner. Oh, Gerda, don't be so slow. It was all the same as it had been, long ago, before John came and took her away. They all thought her slow and stupid. There was nobody to say, as John had said, I'll look after you. Her head ached, and Gerda thought, I'll make myself some tea. She went down to the kitchen and put the kettle on. It was nearly boiling when she heard a ring at the front door. The maids had been given the day out. Gerda went to the front door and opened it. She was astonished to see Henrietta's rakish-looking car drawn up to the curb, and Henrietta herself standing on the doorstep. "'Why, Henrietta!' she exclaimed. She fell back a step or two. "'Come in. I'm afraid my sister and the children are out, but—' 
Henrietta cut her short. Good. I'm glad. I wanted to get you alone. Listen, Gerda. What did you do with the holster? Gerda stopped. Her eyes looked suddenly vacant and uncomprehending. She said, Holster? Then she opened a door on the right of the hall. You'd better come in here. I'm afraid it's rather dusty. You see, we haven't had much time this morning. Henrietta interrupted her again urgently. She said, Listen, Gerda, you've got to tell me. Apart from the holster, everything's all right, absolutely watertight. There's nothing to connect you with the business. I found the revolver where you'd shoved it in that thicket by the pool. I hid it in a place you couldn't possibly have put it, and there are fingerprints on it that they'll never identify. So there's only the holster. I must know what you did with that. She paused, praying desperately that Gerda would react quickly. She had no idea why she had this vital sense of urgency, but it was there. Her car had not been followed. She had made sure of that. She had started on the London road, had filled up at a garage, and had mentioned that she was on her way to London. Then, a little farther on, she had swung across country until she had reached a main road leading south to the coast. Gerda was still staring at her. The trouble with Gerda, thought Henrietta, was that she was so slow. If you've still got it, Gerda, you must give it to me. I'll get rid of it somehow. It's the only possible thing, you see, that can connect you now with John's death. Have you got it? There was a pause, and then Gerda slowly nodded her head. Didn't you know it was madness to keep it? Henrietta could hardly conceal her impatience. I forgot about it. It was up in my room. She added, When the police came to Harley Street, I cut it in pieces and put it in the bag with my leather work. Henrietta said, That was clever of you. Gerda said, I'm not quite so stupid as everybody thinks. She put her hand up to her throat. She said, John! John! Her voice broke. Henrietta said, I know, my dear, I know. Gerda said, But you can't know. John wasn't... He wasn't... She stood there, dumb and strangely pathetic. She raised her eyes suddenly to Henrietta's face. It was all a lie. Everything, all the things I thought he was. I saw his face when he followed that woman out that evening, Veronica Cray. I knew he'd cared for her. Of course, years ago, before he married me, but I thought it was all over. Henrietta said gently, But it was all over. Gerda shook her head. No. She came there, and pretended that she hadn't seen John for years, but I saw John's face. He went out with her. I went up to bed. I lay there trying to read. I tried to read that detective story that John was reading, and John didn't come. And at last... I went out. Her eyes seemed to be turning inwards, seeing the scene. It was moonlight. I went along the path to the swimming pool. There was a light in the pavilion. They were there. John and that woman. Henrietta made a faint sound. Gerda's face had changed. It had none of its usual slightly vacant amiability. It was remorseless, implacable. I trusted John. I believed in him, as though he were God. I thought he was the noblest man in the world. I thought he was everything that was fine and noble. It was all a lie. I was left with nothing at all. I'd, I'd worshipped John. Henrietta was gazing at her, fascinated. For here, before her eyes, was what she had guessed at, brought to life, carving it out of wood. Here was the worshipper, blind devotion thrown back on itself, disillusioned, dangerous. Gerda said, I couldn't bear it. I had to kill him. I had to. You do see that, Henrietta? She said it quite conversationally, in an almost friendly tone. And I knew I must be careful, because the police are very clever. But then I'm not really as stupid as people think. If you're very slow and just stare, people think you don't take things in. And sometimes, underneath, you're laughing at them. I knew I could kill John, and nobody would know, because I'd read in that detective story about the police being able to tell which gun a bullet has been fired from. Sir Henry had shown me how to load and fire a revolver that afternoon. I'd take two revolvers. I'd shoot John with one, and then hide it, and let people find me holding the other, and first they'd think I'd shot him, and then they'd find he couldn't have been killed with that revolver and so they'd say I hadn't done it after all. 
She nodded her head triumphantly. But I forgot about the leather thing. It was in the drawer in my bedroom. What do you call it? A holster? Surely the police won't bother about that now. They might, said Henrietta. You'd better give it to me, and I'll take it away with me. Once it's out of your hands, you're quite safe. She sat down. She felt suddenly unutterably weary. Gerda said, You don't look well. I was just making tea. She went out of the room. Presently she came back with a tray. On it was a teapot, milk jug, and two cups. The milk jug had slopped over because it was over full. Gerda put the tray down and poured out a cup of tea and handed it to Henrietta. Oh, dear, she said, dismayed. I don't believe the kettle can have been boiling. It's quite all right, said Henrietta. Go and get that holster, Gerda. Gerda hesitated and then went out of the room. Henrietta leant forward and put her arms on the table and her head down on them. She was so tired, so dreadfully tired. But now it was nearly done. Gerda would be safe, as John had wanted her to be safe. She sat up, pushed the hair off her forehead, and drew the teacup towards her. Then, at a sound in the doorway, she looked up. Gerda had been quite quick for once. But it was Hercule Poirot who stood in the doorway. The front door was open, he remarked, as he advanced to the table, so I took the liberty of walking in. You, said Henrietta, how did you get here? When you left the hollow so suddenly, naturally, I knew where you would go. I hired a very fast car and came straight here. I see, Henrietta sighed. You would. Uh, you should not drink that tea, said Poirot, taking the cup from her and replacing it on the tray. Tea that has not been made with boiling water is not good to drink. Does a little thing like boiling water really matter? Poirot said gently. Everything matters. There was a sound behind him, and Gerda came into the room. She had a work bag in her hands. Her eyes went from Poirot's face to Henrietta's. Henrietta said quickly, I'm afraid, Gerda, I'm a rather a suspicious character. Monsieur Poirot seems to have been shadowing me. He thinks that I killed John, but he can't prove it. She spoke slowly and deliberately so long as Gerda did not give herself away. Gerda said vaguely, I am so sorry. Will you have some tea, Monsieur Poirot? No, thank you, madame. Gerda sat down behind the tray. She began to talk in her apologetic, conversational way. I am so sorry that everybody is out. My sister and the children have all gone for a picnic. I didn't feel very well, so they left me behind. I am sorry, madame. Gerda lifted a teacup and drank. It is all so very worrying. Everything is so worrying. You see, John always arranged everything. And now John is gone. Her voice trailed off. Now John is gone. Her gaze, piteous, bewildered, went from one to the other. I don't know what to do without John. John looked after me. He took care of me. Now he is gone. Everything is gone. And the children, they ask me questions, and I can't answer them properly. I don't know what to say to Terry. He keeps saying, Why was father killed? Some day, of course, he will find out why. Terry always has to know. What puzzles me is that he always asks why, not who. Gerda leaned back in her chair. Her lips were very blue. She said stiffly, I feel not very well. If John, John— Poirot came round the table to her and eased her sideways down in the chair. Her head dropped forward. He bent and lifted her eyelid. Then he straightened up. An easy and comparatively painless death. Henrietta stared at him. Heart? No. Her mind leapt forward. Something in the tea. Something she put there herself. She chose that way out. Poirot shook his head gently. Oh, no. It was meant for you. It was in your teacup. For me? 
Henrietta's voice was incredulous. But I was trying to help her. That did not matter. Have you not seen a dog caught in a trap? It sets its teeth into anyone who touches it. She saw only that you knew her secret, and so you, too, must die. Henrietta said slowly, And you made me put the cup back on the tray. You meant— You meant her— Poirot interrupted her quietly. No, no, mademoiselle. I did not know that there was anything in your teacup. I only knew that there might be. And when the cup was on the tray, it was an even chance if she drank from that or the other if you call it chance. I say myself that an end such as this is merciful for her and for two innocent children. He said gently to Henrietta, You are very tired, are you not? She nodded. She asked him, When did you guess? I do not know exactly. The scene was set. I felt that from the first. But I did not realize for a long time that it was set by Gerda Christo that her attitude was stagy because she was actually acting a part. I was puzzled by the simplicity, and at the same time the complexity. I recognized fairly soon that it was your ingenuity that I was fighting against, and that you were being aided and abetted by your relations as soon as they understood what you wanted done. He paused and added, Why did you want it done? Because John asked me to. That's what he meant when he said Henrietta. It was all there in that one word. He was asking me to protect Gerda. You see, he loved Gerda. I think he loved Gerda much better than he ever knew he did. Better than Veronica Cray, better than me. Gerda belonged to him, and John liked things that belonged to him. He knew that if anyone could protect Gerda from the consequences of what she'd done, I could. And he knew that I would do anything he wanted because I loved him. And you started at once, said Poirot grimly. Yes, the first thing I could think of was to get the revolver away from her and drop it in the pool. That would obscure the fingerprint business. When I discovered later that he had been shot with a different gun, I went out to look for it, and naturally found it at once, because I knew just the sort of place Gerda would have put it. I was only a minute or two ahead of Inspector Grange's men. She paused, and then went on, I kept it with me in that satchel bag of mine until I could take it up to London. Then I hid it in the studio until I could bring it back and put it where the police would not find it. The clay horse, murmured Poirot. How did you know? Yes. I put it in a sponge bag and wired the armature round it, and then slapped up the clay model round it. After all, the police couldn't very well destroy an artist's masterpiece, could they? What made you know where it was? The fact that you chose to model a horse, the horse of Troy, was the unconscious association in your mind, but the fingerprints. How did you manage the fingerprints? An old blind man who sells matches in the street. He didn't know what it was I asked him to hold for a minute while I got some money out. Poirot looked at her for a moment. C'est formidable, he murmured. You are one of the best antagonists, mademoiselle, that I ever had. It's been dreadfully tiring always trying to keep one move ahead of you. I know. I began to realize the truth as soon as I saw that the pattern was always designed not to implicate any one person, but to implicate everyone other than Gerda Christo. Every indication always pointed away from her. You deliberately planted Igrasil to catch my attention and bring yourself under suspicion. Lady Angatel who knew perfectly well what you were doing, amused herself by leading poor Inspector Grange in one direction after another. David, Edward, herself. Yes. There is only one thing to do if you want to clear a person from suspicion who is actually guilty. You must suggest guilt elsewhere, but never localize it. That is why every clue looked promising, and then petered out, and ended in nothing. Henrietta looked at the figure huddled pathetically in the chair. She said, Poor Gerda. Is that what you have felt all along? I think so. Gerda loved John terribly, but she didn't want to love him for what he was. She built up a pedestal for him, and attributed every splendid and noble and unselfish characteristic to him, and if you cast down an idol, there's nothing left. She paused, and then went on. But John was something much finer than an idol on a pedestal. He was a real, living, vital human being— 
He was generous and warm and alive, and he was a great doctor, yes, a great doctor, and he's dead, and the world has lost a very great man, and I have lost the only man I shall ever love. Poirot put his hand gently on her shoulder. He said, But you are one of those who can live with a sword in their hearts, who can go on and smile. Henrietta looked up at him. Her lips twisted into a bitter smile. That's a little melodramatic, isn't it? It is because I am a foreigner, and I like to use fine words. Henrietta said suddenly, You have been very kind to me. That is because I have admired you always very much. Monsieur Poirot, what are we going to do? About Gerda, I mean. Poirot drew the raffia workbag towards him. He turned out its contents, scraps of brown suede and other coloured leathers. There were some pieces of thick, shiny brown leather. Poirot fitted them together. The holster. I take this, and poor Madame Christo, she was overwrought. Her husband's death was too much for her. It will be brought in that she took her life whilst of unsound mind, Henrietta said slowly. And no one will ever know what really happened? I think one person will know. Dr. Christo's son. I think that one day he will come to me and ask me for the truth. But you won't tell him, cried Henrietta. Yes, I shall tell him. Oh, no, you do not understand. To you it is unbearable that anyone should be hurt. But to some minds there is something more unbearable still, not to know. You heard the poor woman just a little while ago say, Terry always has to know. To the scientific mind, truth comes first. Truth, however bitter, can be accepted and woven into a design for living. Henrietta got up. Do you want me here, or had I better go? It would be better if you went, I think. She nodded. Then she said, more to herself than to him, Where shall I go? What shall I do? Without John? You are speaking like Gerda Christo. You will know where to go, and what to do. Shall I? I am so tired, Monsieur Poirot. So tired. He said gently, Go, my child. Your place is with the living. I will stay here with the dead. As she drove towards London, the two phrases echoed through Henrietta's mind. What shall I do? Where shall I go? For the last few weeks she had been strung up, excited, never relaxing for a moment. She had had a task to perform, a task laid on her by John. But now that was over. She had failed, or succeeded. One could look at it either way, but however one looked at it, the task was over, and she experienced the terrible weariness of the reaction. Her mind went back to the words she had spoken to Edward that night on the terrace, the night of John's death, the night when she had gone along to the pool and into the pavilion, and had deliberately, by the light of a match, drawn Yggdrasil upon the iron table, purposeful, planning, not yet able to sit down and mourn, mourn for her dead. I should like, she had said to Edward, to grieve for John. But she had not dared to relax then, not dared to let sorrow take command over her, but now she could grieve, now she had all the time there was. She said under her breath, John, John. Bitterness and black rebellion broke over her. She thought, I wish I'd drunk that cup of tea. Driving the car soothed her, gave her strength for the moment, but soon she would be in London, Soon she would put the car in the garage and go along to the empty studio, empty since John would never sit there again bullying her, being angry with her, loving her more than he wanted to love her, telling her eagerly about Ridgway's disease, about his triumphs and despairs, about Mrs. Crabtree and St. Christopher's. And suddenly, with a lifting of the dark pall that lay over her mind, she thought, Of course, that's where I will go, to St. Christopher's. Lying in her narrow hospital bed, Old Mrs. Crabtree peered up at her visitor out of roomy, twinkling eyes. She was exactly as John had described her, and Henrietta felt a sudden warmth, a lifting of the spirit. This was real. This would last. Here, for a little space, 
she had found John again. The poor doctor! Awful, in it? Mrs. Crabtree was saying. There was relish in her voice, as well as regret, for Mrs. Crabtree loved life, and sudden deaths, particularly murders or deaths in childbed, were the richest parts of the tapestry of life. Getting himself bumped off like that, turned my stomach right over it did when I heard. I read all about it in the papers. Sister let me have all she could get hold of. Really nice about it, she was. There was pictures and everything. That swimming pool and all. His wife leaving the inquest, poor thing. And that Lady Angertel, what the swimming pool belonged to. Lots of pictures. Real mystery, the old thing, weren't it? Henrietta was not repelled by her ghoulish enjoyment. She liked it, because she knew that John himself would have liked it. If he had to die, he would much prefer old Mrs. Crabtree to get a kick out of it than to sniff and shed tears. All I hope is they catch you ever done it and hang him, continued Mrs. Crabtree vindictively. They don't have hangings in public like they used to once, more's a pity. I've always thought I'd like to go to an hanging. And I'd go double quick, if you understand me, to see whoever killed the doctor hanged. Real wicked he must have been. Why, the doctor was one in a thousand. Ever so clever he was, and a nice way with him. Got you laughing, whether you wanted to or not. The things he used to say sometimes. I'd have done anything for the doctor. I would. Yes, said Henrietta. He was a very clever man. He was a great man. Think the world of him in the hospital, they do. All them nurses and his patients always felt you were going to get well when he'd been along. So you are going to get well, said Henrietta. The little shrewd eyes clouded for a moment. I'm not so sure about that, Ducks. I've got that mealy-mouthed young fellow with the spectacles now. Quite different to Dr. Christo. Never a laugh. He was a one, Dr. Christo was. Always up to his jokes. Given me some awful times he has with this treatment of his... I can't stand any more of it, Doctor, I'd say to him. And yes, you can, Mrs. Crabtree, he'd say to me. You're tough, you are. You can take it. Going to make medical history, you and I are. And he'd jolly you along like. Do anything for the doctor, I would have. Expected a lot of you, he did. But you felt you couldn't let him down, if you know what I mean. I know, said Henrietta. The little sharp eyes peered at her. Excuse me, dearie. You're not the doctor's wife, by any chance. No, said Henrietta. I'm just a friend. I see, said Mrs. Crabtree. Henrietta thought that she did see. What made you come along, if you don't mind me asking? The doctor used to talk to me a lot about you, about his new treatment. I wanted to see how you were. I'm slipping back. That's what I'm doing. Henrietta cried. But you mustn't slip back. You've got to get well. Mrs. Crabtree grinned. I don't want to peg out. Don't you think it? Well, fight then. Dr. Christo said you were a fighter. Did he now? Mrs. Crabtree lay still a minute. Then she said slowly, Whoever shot him, it's a wicked shame. There aren't many of his sort. We shall not see his like again. The words passed through Henrietta's mind. Mrs. Crabtree was regarding her keenly. Keep your pecker up, dearie, she said. She added, He had a nice funeral, I hope. He had a lovely funeral said Henrietta, obligingly. Ah, I wished I could have gone to it. Mrs. Crabtree sighed. Be going to me own funeral next, I expect. No, cried Henrietta, you mustn't let go. You said just now that Dr. Christo told you that you and he were going to make medical history. Well, you've got to carry on by yourself. The treatment's just the same. You've got to have the guts for two. You've got to make medical history by yourself, for him. Mrs. Crabtree looked at her for a moment or two. Sounds a bit grand. I'll do me best, ducks. Can't say more than that. Henrietta got up and took her hand. Goodbye. I'll come and see you again, if I may. Yeah, do. It'll do me good to talk about the doctor a bit. The bawdy twinkle came into her eye again. Proper man in every kind of way, Dr. Christo. Yes, said Henrietta. He was. The old woman said, Don't fret, ducks. What's gone's gone. You can't have it back. Mrs. Crabtree and Hercule Poirot, Henrietta thought, expressed the same idea in different language. She drove back to Chelsea, put away the car in the garage, and walked slowly to the studio. Now, she thought, it has come. The moment I have been dreading. The moment when I am alone. Now I can put it off no longer. Now grief is here with me.
What had she said to Edward? I should like to grieve for John. She dropped down on a chair and pushed back the hair from her face. Alone, empty, destitute. This awful emptiness. The tears pricked at her eyes, flowed slowly down her cheeks. Grief, she thought. Grief for John. Oh, John. John. Remembering, remembering, his voice sharp with pain. If I were dead, the first thing you'd do, with the tears streaming down your face, would be to start modelling some damn mourning woman or some figure of grief. She stirred uneasily. Why had that thought come into her head? Grief. Grief. A veiled figure, its outline barely perceptible, its head cowled. Alabaster. She could see the lines of it, tall, elongated, its sorrow hidden, revealed only by the long, mournful lines of the drapery. Sorrow emerging from clear, transparent alabaster. If I were dead, and suddenly bitterness came over her full tide, she thought, that's what I am. John was right. I cannot love. I cannot mourn. Not with the whole of me. It's Midge. It's people like Midge who are the salt of the earth. Midge and Edward at Ainswick. That was reality. Strength. Warmth. But I, she thought, am not a whole person. I belong not to myself, but to something outside me. I cannot grieve for my dead. Instead, I must take my grief and make it into a figure of alabaster. Exhibit number 58. Grief. Alabaster. Miss Henrietta Savernake. She said under her breath, John, forgive me. Forgive me for what I can't help doing. We hope you have enjoyed The Hollow by Agatha Christie, performed by Hugh Fraser. The Hollow, text copyright 1946, Agatha Christie, Limited. Production copyright 2002, Harper Collins Publishers, Limited. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. 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 Program.